Hello, James. How are you doing? Is it still dark in Canada? This time it is. Day? It is. The days are getting darker. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, it's uh, afternoon, yeah, pretty temperate. Had some rain, but uh, pretty warm. Hello, Lucas. Uh, hi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? Cool, man. No, I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Welcome to the, the little ceramic uh, meetup. Um, yep. You can see Sam. She's our designer. Mm -hmm. And James is in Canada. Mm -hmm. Hi, James. Um, you guys want to, I mean, introduce yourself to each other. Like, um, I basically have met you guys both through Instagram, which is, um, you know, I guess, the way the world has changed. Um, and um, you both like kind of seem to fit this, this idea of a ceramic object, but from different, slightly different places. So, um, James is in Canada. It's 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> Lucas is in Paris. It's uh, 1 p.m. And uh, we also here at 1 p.m. as well. And then there's a lady called Martina who hopefully will join us uh, soon. Um, she's trying to get her Zoom set up. She's um, in, I think she's also, I think she's in Vienna. You said you sometimes work from Vienna, Lucas. Uh, no, not really. Actually, sometimes I work from the Netherlands in uh, Eindhoven, but most of the time I'm here in Paris. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, Eindhoven. Sorry, I got confused. I'm not, my European um, uh, geography is, is not up to scratch. <laughs> um, cool. So, um, like, the whole idea of this thing is just to, like, see how we can work together to, like, create valuable and, and interesting items using this printer that we built. Um, you should be able to see the print. I think that's on the focus screen, but I don't, um, this sort of, I don't know if he's pinned, if you can double click your screen and see something else, I don't really know. I'm actually not sure. You, you, you mean the, 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 the printer running here in the, in the camera the, from Simba, right? Y yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, cool. And then, um, Kev's here, he just arrived. He's uh, also like a local artist. Um, he's been collaborating quite a bit. Um, and then I'm gonna just go across to the objects that we've, um, that we've made so far and just do a recap on the process and like how far we are. And then um, the plan of this week, like the whole thing was to um, kind of finish with uh, some sort of commercial outlet you know, like a web store or a gallery or something, which we haven't quite like figured out yet. So we, we sort of haven't met that target. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys are interested. So depending on what you guys are interested in, we'll determine how we want to spend the afternoon. Um, obviously for Lucas, it's kind of new. So you'd be interested in everything and we're going to show everything. But do you guys see value in that kind of um, the commercial side of it? Like, is there any interest like, uh, see as a digital marketing expert, so you can give us like some insights about how to start a shop and all that. Um, I've built an Instagram shop before, so I can kind of try and remember that and do a step by step, and we can try and start a shop for this project, like right here and now. Um, but if that's not going to interest you guys, then I'd rather not. I don't want to waste your time. I think I. I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm basically starting my whole um, this whole practice with a. Uh, 3D printing. I've been 3D printing for quite some time, but I'm recently starting to uh, design and think of my products to be sold. So I guess this definitely collides with what you're saying now. Uh, so for me, I'm I'm very, I'm interested in just see what can be done and and uh, what can be worked together. Okay, cool. James, on your side, what are your sort of ambitions? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I certainly would be interested in hearing a little more about that. Like, cause I mean, all the all the work we've done so far has been under the mandate of essentially research. So we we haven't really looked into that step, but that is that is something we need to look like into. Um, so is it, no, is no, it, that, are you allowed to spell your research, or is that like not allowed? Um, 
in some capacity yes but we haven't essentially we need to we need to yeah we need to essentially kind of uh decouple a little bit of our research from the facilities that we like yeah they essentially the institutions we research under because yes it technically is under their mandates so but but then that's what we're like genuinely that's what we're planning to do in the next couple months yeah, um, yeah. Is, is is start to separate some of our work from from those institutions so that we are able to solve on our own so yeah yeah okay um i mean there's there's also some like like business development you could think about and pitching the university like to rent the machine from them instead of having to buy your own or, and see if there's a way that they allow for some sort of commercial engagement um yeah i mean it's, it would make sense if they've got a machine you know how to use it and you can create revenue out of it and they they can get some revenue some share of that revenue um seems like a no-brainer but obviously institutions don't always think logically so they might just be like no we don't know how to do that you aren't on the system um but then yeah we must talk about like um just the platform so um how hands-on are you on the on the machines james on the for on the machine yeah on the like the part of bots and the and the other one Oh, we're, 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 we're very hands-on. Do you like repairing it and tweaking yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we're doing, we're keeping it, we're maintaining it, we're, yeah, we're, we're, sure, we're certainly hands-on, we're, we're, we're the ones repairing it, we're the ones, we're the, yeah, we're the ones in charge of keeping that thing afloat, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, yeah, I mean, um, I'm just thinking if you, if you um, wanted to, try and do like an install of something that we we could build um we have this like idea which would be quite cool is um people like to buy machines right they're, 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 because of how we are we want to have control like you know so once a machine there we, it's ours and we can do whatever we want to do. but the idea of like distributed manufacturing and distributed design is like surely like we can have more efficiency if we share machines but then there's not really a much efficiency if there's only one machine in South Africa and you're, you're needing it in France or you're needing it in Canada. But if you had a machine in your, in your, under your control and you could provide products to, to the country that you live um, and people could, you know, they could either commission you to make them product or they could send you a file and ask you to print it for them. But there's quite a lot of manual uh, intervention. Let's just say, I mean, I think you understand that um so um it, it doesn't just like giving someone a machine doesn't mean they're automatically going to produce the items they might not have a kiln they might not know how to use the kiln they might not know how to repair the machine when it's not quite working right or tweak it um so getting the actual product at the end is, is actually like quite a few steps you know um but i had this idea if you have these dotted around the the, the world um, you could have a network and then people could order the product from their local supplier. Um, so it would be like a hybrid of like, you've got a machine, you can use it for whatever you, your products are, but then you can also produce products for the market. Um, and that's what we are thinking about with this machine is to make it a platform rather than selling just a machine and then you're on your own. Because I feel like that could be a, like people might not know what they what they're getting when they just buy the machine. Might not realize that, you know, they're getting a box of parts and it doesn't necessarily equal like a beautiful ceramic object. Um, so if they're buying the machine for the machine's sake, that's cool. But if they're buying it, like if they really just want the object, then they should rather not buy the machine. They should rather, you know, hire the machine or get someone else to produce the product for them. You guys have any thoughts on that, like as an idea and as it would be something that you'd consider like looking into and, and being part of. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not really sure I understood the, the whole idea of the system you are uh, mentioning. It's, is it about um, having different printers? So ceramic printers kind of in different spots in the world and then this shared uh, network of uh, STL files basically, and that people can buy. Uh, so like, let's say, um, James make an STL and somebody in Paris wants to buy it. Well, somebody in Paris wants to buy that vase or that lampshade and then I can print it. And then, um, 
and bake it and glaze it and then the people can buy it physically and then the revenue goes back shared to this sort of community we are creating is that it yeah something like that okay yeah. um I mean, I don't own a um, clay printer yet. I'm working with a guy that I actually, I think this guy follows you and you might follow him as well, James. He's called uh, Digital Craft. Uh, his name is Daniel Valencia Ferrara. He's, he's in Berlin. And uh, we are actually collaborating at the moment. He's printing some, um, some of our products uh, in clay, uh, but that's the closest uh, ceramic printer I can get to and it's in another country. Well, yeah, I, th I think I follow both you and, and Daniel. Yes. <laughs> both. Ah, nice. Yes, yes, yes. I do know. I do know. Yeah. I think we follow each other actually. Yeah. Yeah, I um, do. I follow you. Yeah. No, I would certainly be interested in that idea, Steve, of like, um, cause it is hard, like, especially with like our research mandate, like I would certainly be interested in that and, and more of an idea of like, um, yeah, essentially, I think what you were talking about before um, is this idea of like uh, offloading, like essentially like, because it is very like, yeah, it's a super involved kind of production process um, and having somebody who's aware of that production process, like essentially like paying that idea of essentially like paying for printer time on other printers. I certainly think that's like viable because we have like some of the bigger ones, like the, the, maybe the, I don't know if you've seen like, like the lamps, those, those are kind of like shades yeah. are, are really difficult to produce. Yeah. And cause so we use, we use yeah. a specific machine for those, but we, we've been looking at other, like just kind of stuff that we've done kind of offhanded, like they, that we really enjoy and stuff that we see like essentially design value in like, um, like we did a series of pots a while ago um, and they're like of different sizes, but they're not, they're not very large, but, but they, they do yeah. have certainly like, there's a, they've got a couple embedded patterns in them, but there's like a little bit of a, there's a little bit of design value there that, that, that we could totally see kind of being a bit more feasible to this idea of like, Oh, ordering whatever, 200 of them, right. From a, mm. from a separate manufacturer and, and working in tandem with like, like, because technically that manufacturer doesn't need to, like, it's it also, it does seem a bit silly to essentially, like, like, it says if, if we're all focused on kind of selling online in this global kind of, like, in this truly kind of global sense, uh, it seems a bit silly to, to, to produce 20 of them and then have them shipped, or produce 200 of them and have them shipped to Canada so I can ship them out. <laughs> like, that kind of, like, so, so working, specifically also working with, essentially like producing shipping and selling those those objects as well um, and kind of in other places around the world i think that could certainly be kind of, kind of interesting yeah and then there's also like the shared um knowledge you know like and it's not just the technical knowledge like obviously there's that which is huge but just even like have you ever made 200 of anything and sold it before James? Me? I don't know, sorry. Yeah. All of um, you guys here? No, oh, no. We've we've made we have made two hundred of the same thing, but usually it's the same person buying it. You know what I mean? It's like a system of bricks or something. So it's different. It certainly is different. Like we've 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 done like bulk commission before, but it's yeah. it's usually for like a, a specific product that is essentially going to one client. It's not going to like yeah, it's not being dispersed as like single entities. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also there's like the quality control like aspect. So if, if there's a tight network and everybody has the similar values and they, they kind of understand, um, the product from a similar point of view, then they can maintain that quality, whatever that is. Um, which you could only do obviously if you did it yourself. Um, so on the one hand, you've got full control, do it all yourself. And then on the other hand, you've got like distributed manufacturing, but then like a lack of control of the quality. And then that's where like a network that like a trusted network makes sense. Um, but yeah, I'm just thinking like of, um, at the end of the day, forgetting about the printer, like I, I don't think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but like 
I'm not that excited about the printer. Like I'm excited about the object that come out of the printer. Um, so like the printer is just the mechanism to get these objects. And if, <clears throat> if we sell the printer, like we're like, hey, buy this printer, buy this printer. Like you guys have seen the, the RAM bot, right? Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. And did you, did you order one? No. <laughs> so like, I mean, I would love that to be real, um, like to actually work, but I know that it's not that easy and I know that it's not, it's impractical. Like, you know, it's the idea of what they're selling is like, oh, you can print um, clay just as easily as you print plastic. Except when you get it, you'll realize it's nothing like printing plastic and it's way more messy and it's not like, it's not the same. You, it's like much more artisanal. You've got to get your hands dirty and the quality isn't like, it's a different thing. Um, and then you've got to have the glazing and you've got to like, so making it like a DIY, like everyone can do it yourself. is not, I don't think it's practical, like for, to get nice products. Um, mm. So um, then the other thing you've got is like, yeah, like you said, you can only sell it to your local region. Like if, like, and for us specific, specifically in South Africa, we're very far away from um, like the heart, you know, like, um, the sort of top market who might be interested in these beautiful products. So we would have to ship them like to Europe or to, to, to the States. Um, and that just seems like, it seems unnecessary. You know? um, mm. So I like the idea of like having this connected thing where we start off with a network and we have like uh, Gavin who, who I studied with, he's in the, the States in San Francisco. So he could, he could set up like that one um, and we could have that point of distribution. So we can do a lot of the R&D and make sure we're like really happy with the product and then we can just send prints, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, I think, I just thought the, the idea of having a network would be like, a, like an interesting thing to, to, to think about, especially like you guys are both starting to, I mean, okay, not starting to, you both working in this medium, but you don't necessarily have your own printer that's under your control. Well, James, you pretty much do, like I think just the framing of it's different, but you I mean you got a machine that you maintain? Um, you just gotta get permissions right. Um, but um, yeah, so so that was. Um, I'm so you that you guys are interested, and and I think we should talk more about that. Um, I think I wanted to quickly go across and show you guys the progress of the object, and like obviously, um, Lucas, like kind of a first intro for you. Um, I don't know if I should switch over to my phone. I think. I'm going to try to do that. So just give me a second. <coughs> you there, Hans. Um, Hans, you want to say hello? Hello, yes, Hans. For sure, I'm a bit late, but I just sneaked in. So go on, go on. No problem, Hans. So we've got, um, we've got Lucas Zinto, the designer from Paris, and we've got Hi. James. James from Canada, who's I look um, technically a researcher, but he's basically been playing a lot with ceramics and doing some really nice stuff. Um, I think James, you, was on, you met James on the call like two or three weeks ago. Um, so um, Hans, do you want to just give your quick experience of um, building and selling ceramic 3D printers? I um, don't know that much about the Ramex printers, but I know about the um, Warthog baby. I have sold, sold two of them in South Africa. So just to add on to what you were just saying, um, Steve, um, my experience was that it was um, actually there was um, three ladies in South Africa that was very, very interested in actually buying the printers. So the wool was there, but the technical skills to operate these printers is, um, is not as easy as, a, as an ender that you just buy and there you go. And that, that, has, that has created a sort of a, um, a bit of a false perception they thought it, it it was going to be easy but, but it 
was not, as I'm sure you um, it was have experience. You've got to really, really learn these machines. But I think I will I will invite those three ladies to this meeting and see and um, and see if they can hook up or go further. Cool. And what are the common problems that you run into when you um, are building a ceramic printer or just maintaining ceramic printer? For me, because I built them myself, I have found out the hard way that accuracy is by far, far the biggest problem that I have um, struggled with. And that's to get the six, six arms um, exactly the same length. Um, the, um, the three, the, the three the three pillars must be exactly, exactly um, what, what's it parallel to each other and the same distance from each other. If you don't do that, you just, um, the th um, then your printer works, but the accuracy is, is, is just not there. And if you work with your, with your own printer, you sort of learn to, to tricks to to work around that, but you can't sell a printer like that to a client. They want a spot-on printer. Okay, and is it possible to um, make a, a clay printer, but it that is not a Delta printer, but rather a Core XY printer? Yes, you can. Um, my experience is that you um, is that 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 the Delta printer is actually easy to manufacture because you've got the three legs that's exactly the same. So um, and you've got a bottom frame and a top frame, and that's about it. Um, if you use um, an X Y color. Um, Cartesian printer, you end up with a fairly big printer, which is not that bad. And I, I can almost say, perhaps in hindsight, it's an easier way, way to go. Because the Delta printers, as I said, is a real, real, um, you've, um, your workshop skills need to be really up, up to standard. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we've got some ideas what? about. Um, sorry, Hans. I was going to say no, we've got no. some ideas about converting this. We we built the CNC machine here, um, about converting that into a, like a low bed uh, ceramic printer because we can get a much more large area, like to do more architectural stuff. Um, and then it's just a matter of of fitting the extruder head to this. But obviously, the actual this this height here is our limit. Uh, I can't really see it, but you know, this height becomes the... Yes, I know that they are very... Yeah, 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 you can't go high with them. Yeah, so what we do is change this plate and raise it a bit, but still, it's it's going to have a fixed height. Um, so this will be for a low, flat product, and then we do the, the delta for the for the bigger product. Um, so just, yeah, some of these objects we've done um, on the machine so far. This one collapsed. Um, this was a customer, okay, I guess, drawing. By now. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was Kev's uh, uh, concept. He gave us a concept which had some uh, some handles. We took those off and just made that. And then these are some kind of fragile, kind of okay. like quite quite nice objects. Yeah. Um, and then this is like got a, like a woven type effect, which yep, uh, yep. we started about. And then mm. this is one of the objects that we've done through this collaboration. So this is Alistair from Scotland. He's a designer there. And he was interested in playing with the with the step huts and really exaggerating yeah. them because we were saying <laughs> one of the things that you've got to understand when you're designing for 3D printing is you've got these lines. And so instead of trying to get away from them, yeah. maybe 
you, you embrace them. So that's kind of his, his concept, which is um, someone actually came in. So here's the fired one. Um, someone came in and they were like, um, they really like were taken by this shape. So I'm quite interested in, in this as a, as a exploration. We do need to yeah. work a little bit on the quality of the finish on the bottom. Of course. And then we put, course. we put this one too close to the, uh, to the side of the wall of the thing. So we've got a bit of a bend. Yeah. And then this yeah. is the one okay. of the ones that we, that we glazed. Um, so there's mm. the cobalt and uh, the blue okay. cobalt oxide. And oh, then we did that's quite a, better than last time. The cobalt. Yeah, we did quite a, yeah, we did quite a thick um, uh, clear glaze. And this is a stoneware. And then we did a matte black, which we, we dipped in clear. And we got a very interesting finish. One of the guys, see, uh, Jerry, he was like really excited about this finisher. We've got a few like little occlusions. Um, but that idea of a color and then transparent is interesting. I'm not sure why we have the split line, but we're not ceramicists. So we got to sharpen our skills. But it turned out to be quite a nice object. Um, mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we're quite interested in that one. Um, and then, yeah, some of the ones we've done over the course of the time, we're, we're playing a lot with the terracotta and this kind of uh, gold bronze glaze. Um, Very nice combination, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then we've done a few, like the whites wasn't thick enough. And yeah, we did this one during the last, the, the, the glazing workshop where that's the cobalt hmm. it goes all weird and blistered um and then this is a blue stain with no glaze so it's just still still hasn't been glazed in there um that's quite a nice slightly thicker two more um but a very african woven feel to it um yeah so that's some of the stuff um just to recap i'll just go back in here and show you some of the other test objects um so here we got like a hombre top finish with a clear glaze um and here we played with some stains to see how those turned out um uh these were our early tests with some oxides mixed into the glazes um this aluminium oxide created a really interesting matte finish um oh, if you're yeah. familiar with yes. sandpaper Sandpaper is made of aluminium oxide, so it doesn't surprise now that I realize I put aluminium in, but at 1000 degrees, it obviously becomes oxidated. Exactly, exactly. There you go. So that's yeah. kind of very interesting and uh, not that practical because it yeah. rips onto, um, you know, fabric and, and you can't really wash it. So not for a consumable item, but maybe for a vase or something. Um, yeah. Very masculine. And then also even the, the iron oxide, like very dark rich like oxblood kind of color um so something interesting in the in playing with those two together um and then we we also experimented a bit with this honey glaze which um was just the gold quite a nice rich sheen um it is so yes absolutely. something in that we need to obviously transition it much better in the inside so uh that's also learning in terms of creating a really finished product. And here you can see you've got like some separation where we did the the quick the quick uh, dip in uh, in the white and it was a water-based glaze dip and it just did this strange thing where it maybe there was too much moisture still in, in it or I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. This is where we we need our ceramicists to to join the join the club, and then. We did some wet, some wet um, glazing where you put the bisque in water first, so it's fully saturated, and then you dip it so it doesn't. It's hardly any mm. glaze. It, it becomes um, very like interesting. A satin, satin yeah. kind of finish, almost like fabric, which has got some appeal to it as well. Definitely. Um, I think that is the gold. It might be gold with clear on top, but it might Jeez, just be gold. It's amazing, eh? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get that again. Um, yeah, and then like, like I said, the luster with the with the ceramic to me, I, I quite like it. Um, mm, mm. Uh, yeah, so those are some, and then just like the coloured ones. Just to yeah, focus. 
Um, yeah, so that is um, some of the objects. And then um, this was something Martina suggested. It's called a scutoid, um, which is a newly okay. discovered geometry, actually. Yes. Discovered yes, in 2018. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's quite interesting. So there's, there's two like generators that, yeah. and things. Yeah. Um, so it's five sided on one side and, and six sided on the other. Uh, sorry, got a phone call there. And then here we're looking at like kind of this nested type of look um, for, yeah. for a light fitting. Yes, so, it's actually okay. Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, here's another one, just in a white earthenware. Mm. Uh, so that needs to be glazed. And then these two obviously are stoneware, the same as that one, and we're going to glaze those. And then this is the, this was one of the ones we glazed during the glazing part of the, of the collaboration, the matte black and then a clear Again, not exactly polished and finished, but just interesting anyway. Um, and then also some of these, like the cobalt again, does that weird blistering effect. This yeah. looks like a moon rock. <laughs> just about, yeah. And then that's uh, just a black, black glaze. Um, and then this is a, that's a clear, clear glaze so it just looks wet and obviously seals yeah. the, the earthenware so it's no longer porous okay and then this is like sort of the object of the of the whole thing of the whole collaboration this happened to be the object that we all worked on um, mm. so alex contributed the design um, we did a this is matte black glaze and this is regular black dipped and matte black oh, okay. comes out gray um, but the object gave us trouble and it collapsed quite a bit and, and it, it was uh, interesting. I but remember James that, yeah, then, yeah. Yeah, James then converted this into G-code. And yeah, we had a problem with the extruder. Um, okay. And then, yeah, we just about finished, but we also just missed it the mm. last bit. And then this one was a, was a finished G-code, printed the whole thing. It's got a really thick base. Is, so is that the stuff? Is, is that the stuff you have done with grasshopper? Yes, yes, it is. Because it's James. absolutely fabulous. Because James, with, my, with my methods on CAD, <laughs> you yes. can't, you can't do that. You will. Um, I can. I can. I can do that for a cylinder or something like that. Uh, just yes. a very simple shape, but that type of thing where you've got a illegal, um, an oval or an ellipse in top view, and then you get those things. It's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a whole, a whole avenue that you can start experimenting with. James, what do you, what do you think? Oh yeah, no, I think it turned out really well. I just that this is a a, a, a code. That, yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing about kind of parametricizing this work. It was a code for a piece that we had done completely. Like we had, we it was something else we had done. Um, but I had that piece of code, and and we had this geometry. So I just applied it to the really? I applied that that's... kind of pattern to the geometry, and it turned out quite yeah. well. No, it really did. Yeah, it really came out excellent. So the question is what, uh, how we want to glaze this. So that, that was kind of, so this uh, is a mix of earthenware, but uh, you can see how the terracotta, pure terracotta goes. And then, so these are a blend of these two, these two clays. And we end up with a slightly pinker. Um, we were hoping for like a bit more, like of a contrast, like a bit more um, striking contrast. We've got a very, um, slow blend so um kind of a fail on the blending um yeah so so i don't know like um 
The idea was what, what you guys thought we should do in terms of glazing. Of all the, the different options that you've seen, like which one do you think should be applied to these objects? I thought it would either be, um, I think my vote would just be a clear glaze, genuinely, so, <laughs> so you can still kind of, so it doesn't, um, like, I like the clear glaze on that terracotta, yeah. and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily obscure the kind of uh, tool path. You know, yeah. I mean, if, I just don't know how, like, um, how pooling might affect the kind of, the, the, that intense patterning. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a clear glaze might be kind of the best way, or like keeping one, just keeping one non glaze and one clear, or, or, you know what I mean, kind of, Maybe like I do like that black band at the top that you've been doing. So yeah. maybe just maybe keeping it like the raw terracotta with the black band on top, like be really nice, the way of finishing it. I was um so when I studied at the design academy in uh, Eindhoven, I was uh, when I was in first year, I was um helping this guy called uh, Olivier Van Hert, which is quite famous yes. in uh, yeah and so so uh, i was um kind of like the assistant with many others with uh, his whole um the first concept of his 3d printer and um actually what olivier does he doesn't glaze anything he just glazes the inside and i am actually maybe that's a heritage i got from him but i like the idea that um um, that the inside gets glazed because it needs to hold water and stuff like this, but the outside, the quality of the clay and the mm -hmm. texture of the clay itself is for me yeah. so enjoyable as a material mm -hmm. uh, that I would probably leave them unglazed or maybe find some um, very, very matte glazes. I like the uh, aluminium oxide glaze that you've shown. Um, mm. But um, I'm more into not glazing than glazing. Okay, well that's cool. I mean, I it's think a, less is it's more. Actually eh? very, like it. uh, it's actually interesting. I also pre 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 prefer um, the clear glaze or nothing at all. Perhaps on the inside, as as you have said, Lucas, just to make it watertight. But I think. Um, the whole object is almost to show a new perspective on, on the clay, what you can do with this technology. Um, because for me, almost everybody know g -g 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 glazing and it is nice, but this technology, you want to show the technology. But yeah, that's just me and I, I, I'm sure everybody will have their own um own own Reference. opinion here yeah. and by the end of the day the, the the opinion that's going to matter is the guy with the money that walk walks into the shop true <laughs> because that that's by the end of the day you want to sell the items mm. And so, so um, Steve, you were mentioning a few things about the fact, well, it's also like something I've heard many, many times in clay printing, that it's very often that you get your designs collapsing uh, in mid prints or, mm. or when you're baking them and stuff like this. And when I was um, doing pottery and that I was doing very big vases, um, I would uh, use a torch in the, uh, like in the, um, even though the, um, uh, the shape wasn't finished, I would use a torch to no. uh, dry the clay and get it to what's called uh, leather hard. It's one of the, um, you know this probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm, I was thinking like, since for example, um, when I print uh, materials in plastic, like ABS or polycarbonate, stuff like this, I often use a heated chamber uh, yeah. to too, have yeah. To have no warping. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't know about this one, but I guess it could work as well. And is it possible to have uh, some sort of heated chamber in a ceramic printer to like a very controlled heated chamber or like maybe a fan uh, uh, blowing hot air or something like this to yeah. get the clay to be stronger, like more structural and not collapsing? I mean, it's, it's obviously it is it is obviously possible and it's, it makes sense, but um, the reality of it is the speed. So like here you can see, we've got, we've got a fan blowing 
blowing air onto just to help a little bit of dehydration. But this clay is really quite soft and the speed it's going, like I don't know if that dehydration will happen quick enough to actually make a difference. Mm, okay. Um, there is a company that um, I think the approach is to heat up the chamber so that the clay it, itself heats up, you know, because you've got this problem of heat transfer, like of, of between the, the particles of clay, like for the temperature to move through the clay so that it, it can dehydrate. Um, and generally, um, it's going to take quite a lot of time for the hot air from the outside to get all the way through to the inside. Um, so if you can heat the clay up and it can be like at 70 degrees or something where there's, you know, it's going to create evaporation quite quickly. That might be something to, to look at. I know Hans has built his other printers are, um, they don't have an extruder that uh, uses filament. They just use uh, raw material pellets. So he's actually mm -hmm. built a heated extruder head um, onto his bigger printers. So maybe he could talk about like how that might work um, as um, as an option. Um, but I think that could help. Um, for now, obviously, we just kind of uh, staying within the limits of the geometry and the and the, the physics around the clay because it has to be a little bit more fluid in order for it to print nicely. It can't be like completely um, like the same. If you're coiling it, you know, it, it, it can't be that kind of texture. In fact, I think um, I can show you the texture here. Um, let me just, uh, so like you can see it's quite like sticky. Okay. It's not, it's not at all um, like boiling or anything. It's, it's, we we do actually um we do torch our prints when they go up sometimes yeah yeah we do torch our uh, we do torch our prints sometimes we just got to be careful around the, the uh yeah we got to be careful around the printer head and around, <laughs> yeah. around the, the 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 mechanics of it but like for the larger ones we, sometimes we have to torch it but it's 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 it, we, we don't we don't like to do it because it's a bit difficult because you can't you're not on a wheel you can't just kind of like e that even torching is really difficult because you're not on some sort of like you're actually you're like running around the print trying to yeah. torch it it's because it's uh, you have to keep it in place so it's it's not our favorite thing to do but but we do we do we do have to do they, it sometimes they, they is of course another method that I have tried sort of and that have worked the the best for my cement um 3d printing if you want to work with cement there um i'm sure if you are familiar with cement everything go, there goes uh, uh, goes um about the slump test and that's that's exactly if you bolt up how easy it is to fall um um for for, for the whole thing to fall down. And um, the thing that would that have work, worked best for me is um, cement hardening accelerator that you buy. It's a powder. And you mix a certain amount of that into the cement mix. And then instead of five hours to, to reach uh, whatever stiffness, it just takes two hour or half an hour. And, and of course, the problem there is if you, if, if there's something holding, holding you up and your cement um, starts to set while it's still in the extruder, then, then, then of course, you've got big problems uh, to, to try and get the fixed cement out of the extruder. So then we've worked um, we've made a special big salt shaker and we added the, the accelerated powder into the big salt shaker. So uh, when we've printed one layer, we've stopped um, just for um, 10 seconds and, um, and what's it, shake a layer of this accelerator um, powder onto the wet cement and then do the next layer. And so um, by, by the time you're doing the next layer, 
um, the layer underneath that is already, it's got a thin, thin, thin um, skin that's not hard, but it's, it, it is harder than, than the normal cement. So that way we could build up a lot higher with the cement than was um, possible um, before. So I'm not sure what, um, that's again where, so, where a potter might come in with, oh yes, you need to, you need to um, 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 uh, what's it, add this or that pep, this or that powder um, to the, um, to the model you, um, you are extruding or building. Yeah, some sort of dehydrator. Yes, um, yes, model. exactly. But so, yeah. what is the name? What is the name of that uh, uh, component compound? Uh, is it's a powder or something? It 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 it's a powder. It is just an accelerator. If you go to a cement shop, um, not not your hardware shop, go to the factory or 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 or, or the big distributors. They know what you're talking about. They've got flat sizes and yep. uh, and accelerators. And if you want to get to a nice cement mix, you start messing around with the plastic sizes, number one, and then 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 number two, the, the, the accelerators. Okay. So I'm um I'm I'm sure they, um, there must be some chemical that will do that to the clay as well. Yeah, very probably, um, but it needs to be something that can still go in the kiln and will not explode like of plaster, course, for example. Course. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's probably, um, the heat is probably the, the one that makes the most sense. I think, um, um, Heating. So, so Hans, when you do your heated extruder for your um, for your cheetah printer, do you um, do you have like a long extrusion chamber that you have heating bands around, or how do you how do you heat up the plastic pellets? Um, I use uh, these. <laughs> I'm actually working with them now. Where are they? <clears throat> I'm using these little heaters, 40 watt little heaters. And it, okay. They, 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 they seem to work. I, um, in, in the beginning, when I started with this, I was using um, the, um, resistance wire and insulation, ceramic insulation beads and lots of different methods, but Eventually, I find out these things work, and um, even with my even with with my big printers, I just use two of them, eighty watts, and that seems to be okay. The okay. Um, um, the the other thing, where my ceramic printer and yours do um, do differ, is that you've got the you've you. You've got the cartridge that's under pressure, then goes through the pipe, and then you've got the metering auger. So mm. you are, you can't go very stiff on your clay. Mm. And yeah. I have I've been there, done that. I've had lots of hassles with that, and I decided that no, I I want to go stiffer with my clay. So I've made a big syringe um, to do that. And I'll show you the first one. You can see this is a, this is a 50, 50 millimeter pipe. And I've got a, um, um, a stepper motor with a big reduction in here. That, yeah. that uh, the, 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 the eleven this one. And with this, with that method, you can um, generate much higher pleasures above your nozzle. 
So it means you can go stiffer with your clay. It means, okay, um, it means if you go in um, the problems you encounter is getting bigger as well because you, um, your pleasure is going higher and higher. So it means the explosions you're getting is bigger and bigger. <laughs> and, um, but it works. So that is definitely, and I'm sure you've seen on the potters what the potters are talking about, the finger taste for, for clay. That um, if you, um, you must be able to, to push your finger into, into the, the clay without your finger bending over. Um, and that's not the, I hate it because it's not the engineering <laughs> measuring method, but it looks like that's the universal potter's measurement. And I've started to use that and it looks like um, it works. <laughs> so, so when you, um, say, you say not having your finger bend over, does the clay not stick to your finger? No, um, no. Um, if they, if you work with the clay, it um, it doesn't stick to your hand. Not, not at all. So, so it is a lot stiffer than that clay that mm -hmm. you have shown. So um, that is one. But but you see, that's a complete um, change of, of the system. If you want to go with stiffer clay. Okay. Um, James, when you're working with the clay, you've got the two printers, I think. Um, do you? What is the variation you can you can you can play with with your setups? And what's your comments on the two options or the different types? Um, so, I mean, the the we we we've got a, a Potterbot SLX one, which is like that mass, like it's their massive Scara type printer. Um, and it is just, it's like a, it's a 3,600 CC tube. It's a massive tube. It's like 20 pounds of clay, um, but it is, it's, it's the oh, syringe. Okay. It's a big, it's like, and it's got a massive stepper motor and a syringe. So it's, I understand how like, like to build one, it is super difficult. And it's like, it's, it's, it's a very specialized piece of equipment, which makes it a little difficult, but, but, um, but the, the clay can be much thick, like the clay can be um, like almost in like a soft wedgeable state. Um, so, so it doesn't, it's not sticky, um, which means there's a lot more structural rigidity. The problem is just that printer is like, that, that printer is quite expensive and it's like hard to manu, like it's, I, I wouldn't know where to begin manufacturing like a scar type printer with like a, that can hold a 20 pound arm. Mm. Um, but but that being said, that like that syringe, I think that their printer might be like the large scar. Like it might be the largest syringe type extruder. And but... scar is the Italian uh, brand, right? It's the Italian manufacturers making those printers, right? Uh, the what's the no, Italian? That's the, wasp, it... that's the wasp 3D. So what are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wasp 3D. Is have, the scar is where you have um, the arm. Yeah, yeah, it's like an arm. Yeah, it's right. Like a moving okay. arm. Right. And yeah, it means yeah. that you've got a lot of weight to carry around. So your your mechanism has to be really strong, which means that it has to be quite expensive. So the the weight of the like with our design, the weight's all carried by like a mechanism where the clay is, and all it has to carry is the weight of the pipe. So you can have much yeah. easier motors and and, and structures. Um, the, w the way I I came around that problem was to do an inverted um, delta printer. That means the big, um, 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 the big syringe was standing on top and it stayed stationary. And um, the platen was rising up, up to the nozzle and then starting to, to drop down slowly as it printed. So of course uh, the um, the bad thing of that design is your pot is translating all the time. So if you go too fast, then your pot fell over. <laughs> so it's uh, sort of six of the one or half a dozen of, of the other. But at least with that method, like you said, then you can put um, to 20 pounds of clay into the extruder. I eventually end up with an extruder that was 
um, 75 millimeter in diameter and I think about 900 meters long. So that was also, also quite heavy, um, but it worked. It worked actually beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we, we really enjoyed this. Like it's, yeah, it, we, we enjoyed the, 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 the Otterbot, the Scara type printer. We, we have another, which is like a carriage printer. It's like the, the, the Ludum V4. Um, it's quite nice too. It's an auger. It's a pressurized cartridge system with an auger, but the pressurized cartridge, it's not attached to a tube. The pressurized cartridge is also attached to the, to the X-axis arm. So it's, it, yeah, everything's kind of still attached to the arm. So it's still carrying like the, the carriage still carries the weight of the clay. Um, and so it's much similar to like the Delta kind of the, the, the Delta system, um, of, of, of a pressurized system. But, but in that one, also the clay doesn't, because there's not a tube connecting them, there's a little less pressure. Like the, the cartridge feeds right, like directly into the auger. Yes. So because of that, the pressure, like the pressure required to, to print is a lot less. It's, I think we, 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 we usually pressurize it to like two or three bar and then, and then we're able to print, um, I, 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 that one's, I mean, the stop start functionality is nice. The, the SCAR type printer, like the, the Delta, the Potter bot, there's no stop or start functions. You like, the, yeah, there's about a 30 second delay in extrusion versus like starting to print. So, you, and yeah, there's no, there's no stop or start function. So it has to be conceived of as like a single surface or at least a continuous tool path, um, which is sometimes difficult, but, but it's it's really quick like the thing prints like having i understand the appeal of having just a really large stepper motor because it prints so quickly um it can move a lot of material really really fast i don't um, know what is the uh, average of um, printing speed in uh, clay printing but my friend daniel prints around um 75 millimeter per second which is approximately what i print at when i print plastic so it seems that you can print actually quite fast with um my clay printers, right? Yeah, yeah. We like our our the biggest pieces that we work with, like our largest pieces, print in like I don't know seventy minutes. So it's not bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's not really bad quick. at all. Yeah, like a, a close to an hour. Uh, most of our pieces print in. So and then we're also taking it. We probably could bump that a little bit. Um, we're taking a little slower just because they're they're a bit they're like they get yeah they get a little unstable. Yeah. Um, but 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 you could totally if you had a more stable form, I'm sure you could push that number. Also, the problem with the Potterbot, um, uh, not the Potterbot, but the problem with a scar type printer where you're carrying all the weight, um, we can't do sharp corners. Um, there's a lot of shuddering in the printer. Like it's a really nice printer. It's 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 a, it's a commercially manufactured printer. Um, that but that being said, you're still carrying like you're still swinging like a 20 pound arm out. So any, like, any sort of like sharp turns uh, is met with a lot of shuddering. And that shuddering is translated into like essentially like waves in the print. So we need to be very careful about just in the way we conceive of geometry, everything's got very soft corners because that thing, that thing does not like to stop on a dime. It really doesn't. <laughs> it's really just because, yeah, there's only one point of reference and it's so, it's like the, 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 the printer's amazing. It's like, a, it's a meter and a half tall. Like it can, it can print up to a meter and a half, but it's, yeah, when it meets when it meets a sharp corner going at like mock speeds, the whole printer will start to shake and and there's nothing we can do about it. like that's just a fundamental. It's just, it's just a fundamental of like having such a large printer with such a large arm. It does not it doesn't like those sharp corners. So very delicate objects. We we just can't do delicate objects on it. It's only we only print like we print all our delicate objects on like a, a carriage type printer and we print kind of the, the much larger things on the on a scar type printer. That's why I'm wondering if it is possible to use to because I've never seen a clay printer, but a as a core XY type, you know, the types with the very, very, very long um, belts uh, and actually the X motor. Um, like both motors, they if, if, if you want your carriage, for example, to go to the right, then both motor have to turn. Uh, mm -hmm. in opposite directions and in that sense it, it allows you to have um, to have a much better control inertia of the um, carriage uh, and there is never any uh, sharp stops and then you can achieve 
um, sharp corners at very, very high speeds. Uh, basically, you probably have seen those videos on YouTube of those guys printing um, plastic at um, 1000 millimeter per second uh, with an excellent print quality. And this is all done on Core XY printers. And I've always wondered why it's not possible to do this um, with a clay printer because uh, it, 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 it's basically the mix between a Cartesian and a Delta. Yeah, yeah. I think the, well, the core thing with, with the clay printer is the weight of the clay. Um, so that, that's the like, we'll say limiting factor. Like that's the thing that gives all the issues. And like, if you have um, like the machine, like James was talking about where it's carrying that 20 pounds, you know, of clay, 10 kilos of, of clay, then there's just that inertia. So you'd need like ridiculously strong motors. And then if you look at Hunter's option where he's moving the bed, then even the weight of the object becomes significant. And also you're moving yeah. the object. So that's a, the that's a problem. Like we, what we thought about, like we haven't actually worried about it now because we haven't got to a point where we've, I guess, tried to create specific things and, and failed. We just try all different things and we're not really yeah. concerned about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but we've thought about the way that we mount the, the cartridge and we at one stage had it mounted through the middle. Um, with a Delta printer, you can, you can um, counterweight the, 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 the payload, so to speak, so that you carry that weight through like a spring or through something else. And then you're just carrying the weight of the head um, and just has to have enough freedom of motion so that it doesn't pull, you know, on, on the, and that way, if we reduce the pop, the shorter the pop, the less pressure, the thicker the clay can be. Until you get to a point where the, the, the head can actually be mounted, like in the, in the one that James is talking about with the Vorm, 3, Vorm 1. Um, but the problem with that uh, at the moment, I think the Vorm cartridge is quite small, James, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then you're limited by, you know, having to replenish cartridges is a pain. So you kind of want to put as much in as you can. So you can just like um, get it sorted, get it, because the extrusion and the, and the clay. Um, the clay um, thickness and the clay consistency are linked. So it's not like a normal print where you, you know the consistency of PLA and so you just, you use that, it never changes. You have to like almost calibrate the extrusion flow with the, um, with the thickness of the clay. So between batches of clay, you have to tweak it. And that's, you don't really want to do that on every print because then it's like, you're almost going to get to a point where you can't control the quality. So like we've gone for a bigger, um, a bigger clay vessel. Um, and now we just, the easy way is just to use that flexible pop. But we, if we really need to, we can move that into the center, counterweight it, and then um, we could bring, we could reduce the size of that pop and thicken up the clay. Um, so as far as the speed goes, the limiting factor for us is the, the extruder. Um, when we go above a certain speed, we can't get enough torque on that extruder and we start to get like vibrations. And so um, we generally print around 30 millimeters per second. Um, but because we're printing one millimeter at a time, you can print the cup in 15 seconds, you know, I mean, 15 minutes, you can print a vase in half an hour and, and 45 minutes. So, um, yeah. and, then, and then also because the clay is quite soft, you know, if you, it, it's, it's touching on the top. So if you, even when you pull it off, like you, you, you move a bit of clay and as you're moving, you're actually pushing the clay itself. So if you're going fast, you're just creating like more problems. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of, I guess we haven't hit those limits. We can do enough with it now that makes sense to, to focus on the objects. Um, but I guess if you think about it, you get to a point where you get to, you want a certain object and you just can't physically print it because the clay is too soft. Then you start thinking about, okay, are we gonna heat the clay? Are we going to reduce the size of the transfer pipe so that we can um, we can increase the thickness of the clay? Um, yeah, but those are things we have. I haven't really like. It's it's funny because Hans, like I started with with where you ended, so I started with a piston and a driven motor, mm -hmm. and then I eventually went all the way back to to the pressurized piston and the extruder head just because you can get more control um, over the extrusion speed. And when you've got that piston, you've got like very little control because you're distributing that pressure through this whole amount of clay. 
and like if you stop you know there's still a pressure there like it's, it's almost like that inertia of of the of the clay is there as well um so with extruder we can stop instantly and we can you know we can increase and, yeah, and reduce yeah, like absolutely like, yeah um now i agree so, with you there <laughs> so it's almost like if you can combine the two and then and then just increase the payload and and create a structure that carries that weight yeah, um yeah. And then use the motor just to control the the motion and not carry the actual weight of it. That makes the most and, sense to get. And also, I see that one is developing um, the the things you you are making to suit the tools in your workshop. So um, all these methods can work, uh, but they will they will produce some some different results which is fine which i uh, which i think is exactly good because um then you've got lots of different options for different guys and it's a variety it's nice and um steve you were mentioning last time through uh, instagram that uh, it is quite hard to print uh porcelain we didn't try that hard. Um, James will know because he's definitely done porcelain. Um, we just bought like different clays and one of the clays was porcelain. And then I just told my guy to put it in and print it. And he, he just came back and said, no, I thought printing that well. And we kind of just took it out and printed with something else. And the, the object that we printed was like much thicker than it was supposed to be. So we had almost like, it didn't slump and stick nicely together. Um, mm, okay. But um, I think if, I'm pretty sure that if we really need to print porcelain, we'll we'll kind of figure it out. Um, okay. But I'd like to know from James because I know he's done, and and Hans as well. If he's done porcelain, what what's your feeling? How what are the properties of porcelain in terms of printing it? No, we are at the same we are at the same level there, Steve. I've also it's on my on my to do list, but I've never actually done it. So yeah, you're actually one step ahead of me there. Um, I like the idea of um, James. I think you're doing porcelain where the lights can almost come through, or semi-translucent. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do a lot of porcelain. Um, uh, it's it it certainly is a struggle. Uh, it's it's not it's not as friendly as it all depends on the porcelain too. Um, we're using a couple. So we're using a couple custom porcelain clay bodies that, that come from the states that are like essentially low fire, high translucency. So they're they're cone they're cone six porcelains, um, and we use cone six porcelains just because it's much it's much easier to get them into our like it's much easier to get them in our uh, in with other firings and stuff. Um, um, we don't like kind of we, we like keeping everything kind of in the world of cone six, and and they're really really high translucency, but they're like they've got a lot of plasticizers in them. Um, like just as a material to work with, it's a lot denser and it's a lot stickier. So uh, I can imagine it there being a lot of kind of run-ins with clay consistency. Um, we use it only on, we don't print porcelain on mascara. We, we scara type like the potter bot. We only print it on ludum, which is like the, the pressurized cartridge and auger type system. Um, Cause the other one just can't print that thin. Um, and it's, it's fine. It's, it's just a matter of like, I mean, it prints well. Um, it prints cleanly, it prints well. It's just a matter of uh, getting the consistency correct. Um, and it's, you can't, like the biggest thing for us is you can't pre-prep it. Um, a lot of porcelains, like essentially they'll start to, um, and a lot of porcelains that use plasticizers, um, it's like for clay, like printing, um, have this weird, like weird kind of, uh, if, you, if you leave it to sit for a couple hours, it'll start turning into platelets. And those platelets essentially in like a pressurized cartridge system, those platelets will form cracks in the porcelain and, and you'll get like a, I'm sure you've experienced this before, Steve, like in your pressurized cartridge, you get like a shot of, of air that essentially like blows out the printer. We get that quite a bit, um, which, which means we just, you can't leave it for more than like a couple hours essentially. So, so we kind of, we prep, um, prep and print the material as quickly as possible. And we all do it. Like we don't, we don't preload cartridges for next day printing. We have to do everything same day. Um, but other than that, like that's the only, that's been the biggest workaround is just knowing how much like the working window, the working window is much smaller. We can, we can pre-prep other materials and leave them for days and they'll still print the porcelain. We have to print it in like five or six hours. 
but other than that, no, it's just, it's just, it's a really dense, it's really sticky material. It's harder on your hands, but, but it prints, it certainly prints fine. Um, it, it does require different calibrating though, certainly. The, the, um, the porcelain that um, uh, Daniel prints is the Mont Blanc porcelain. Uh, and he's tried different porcelains. And in his opinion, that's the one that uh, prints the best. He often tells me that it's such a pleasure to work with um, the Mont Blanc porcelain because it's so translucent and uh, so easy to print. And that comes from a specific region, like in, in France, they take it out and- By the name, supplier. I would that's guess, probably, honestly, I wouldn't know. Uh, probably that's the name of the supplier or the, I wouldn't know, I, I don't know really. Um, that's the other thing that we were talking about with Hunts is like, when people buy a printer, or they bought two of his, he sold two printers, they, um, he says that they must use a specific clay, right? Clay supplier, because he knows that works. And then they just use whatever they want. And then it doesn't work. And they like get upset. Um, so yes, yes, yeah, there's definitely this calibration issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, we got what do you think? Oh. Yeah, I was going to oh, ask no. you, what's your, what's your best practice in terms of calibrating? Is it just totally by feel? You can't replicate it or you have like a bit of a system? Uh, for us? No, we, we, have a, we have a system actually for most, um, most cone, six, cone 04, cone 06 clays. Um, they usually come, I mean, I don't know if it's a standard. I think it's like what, what uh, 40 pounds, 40 pound, 50 pound boxes. Um, we usually just add two cups of water to the box and that's it. Like we, we, we mm -hmm. dice it up, we add two cups of water. Um, and then essentially we, we, we let it sit for a couple of days. We like, we empty it into a container and let it sit for a couple of days. Um, we kind of rotate the container a couple times and, and it's usually good to go. Um, we, we usually take it all out. We, we wedge it all. We've got a pug mill, which is amazing, yeah. uh, which is a beautiful thing. So we've got a pug mill um, and um, we just pug all the clay and it, it, it's, 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 but, but truly, I think you're right. A lot of it just like, it's hard to, each batch of clay we get from the, the distributor close to us is a different, it has a different moisture level and we're just poking at it. We've just developed a feel for, we give it a pinch and we, we know it's okay or it's not, <laughs> but, but that's just that, come that's from. That's exactly what I said about that um, potter's finger taste. You, you learn after a while, yeah, now it's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, but that, that's, I know that's not, that's not very helpful for, for others. So we, we do two yes. cups, two cups is, cause it's just, yeah, like we can, we'll, we'll, we'll take a poke at it and we'll, we'll know if it's ready to print or not, but, but two cups usually gets us there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something as well that we could, we could collaborate on is like actually coming up with some sort of like scale, like testing scale. Like we have this thing, um, I read it online on the Wikifab uh, website where you get a syringe, you fill it with the clay and then you push it down on, um, on a scale. Um, and so obviously it registers the amount of pressure you need. And then, and when it starts, you know, it starts coming out. And then when you, when you get to that weight where it sort of stops or, or at the weight where it starts coming out, that's, that's kind of your calibration. And then depending on whatever that kilogram rating is, then you, you know that for next time. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's one way people do it. Um, yeah, we, that's, Oh, as you say, we also, in order to like, in order to print like the thickest material possible, we also lube all like, we, we lube all the, we lube the interior of the cartridges, um, which helps quite a lot. Um, it's just, just something, I don't know, if, like a lot, not, not, not everybody does it, but, but we found it really helps. Um, well, like with soap water, we'll essentially like, we'll also use essentially, um, we'll use um, lithium grease to, to lube everything. And then we'll, we'll, We'll we'll coat the interior with with like soap water, yeah, um, and that, yeah. that really helps. I'm so. using the soap water as well. That um, for the inside of of my cartridge, I first spray it with some soap water, and that's fine. Okay, no, that probably would have helped us when we started because we 
we didn't use any lube and we just like damn this thing just is like jamming up and it's so hard to push <laughs> and uh um we made a piston and we put we printed o-rings out of flexible plastic and we tried to get the tolerances and we like um eventually we were just like nah just use air um, and we it doesn't stick at all it's a clear acrylic um tube five mil thick and you, you just see right through it and you can see how much clay you got left and you get to about that much and then you just have that explosion at the end <laughs> um but yeah it's um I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do that little online thing, but maybe um, I thought, Lucas, if you don't mind, like you could just kind of um, talk to us a bit about your design practice and, and what you kind of into at the moment and where you see like ceramic printing fitting in with that. And uh, I mean, yep. so just, just to contextualize, like what I said to everyone on this, on this call was like, we all want to play with ceramics objects that are 3D printed. That's a common, is a common thing, but like, we also need them to be we also need to be productive so we want it to end somehow in a commercial outcome that uh, can allow us to continue to explore it um and that's not our, any of our strengths so we're trying to like borrow from each other and kind of figure out so one of the things you could you could help us all with would be like what is it how do you get a design practice to work like what is it that is important and not important when it comes to like selling objects that you've designed um you know how do you position them like so give you an example we've um we've printed all these cups it's a design that i made quickly just because the uh, the, the the genesis of our printer was we wanted i wanted to print a cup that i could have my coffee out of and i really enjoy a good coffee and uh, a milk-based coffee ca a cappuccino and i wanted a cappuccino cup and so i, I like I, I really wanted to print my own but i didn't want it to be a plastic i wanted it to be out of clay and I looked online and you, at one stage you could print ceramics like on a bureau and then they just stopped it. And then I was like, you can't really get it and it's so expensive. And then at some point I was like, no, let me just experiment. I've done a bit of paste extrusion. We had um, worked out how to print icing sugar as a bit of a novelty. I was like, no, I'm sure we can print clay. Like there's gotta be a way. And I, I got my intent to build like the frame of the machine. And we started like experimenting and then I printed that object. And then people come and they're like, wow, we really like this cup can we buy it? And I'm scared to put a price on it because I feel like once I put a price on it, then like maybe it'll be too low, you know? And then if I'm, if I ask for a very high price, I feel embarrassed. I'm like, I, so I don't, I don't offer to sell it, which I either give it to people or I just say it's not for sale yet, but that doesn't help us. Like how do we pay the bills and carry on going? So I'd love to know a bit about like your practice and maybe what you've seen from successful designers and, and um, yeah, man, I mean, it would be very valuable. I think to everyone on the call. Well, it's um, I've I've also had a very hard time uh, pricing my products. I graduated two years ago, and so until then, I've I've always been a student. And when I was selling my products or ideas or my services to um, architects, designers, or whatever, um, uh, I was always um, down pricing my. Uh, things because I've uh, I know the value I mean I've, I'm always working I work a lot and so for me from for just for me the value of my hours is probably way lower than how it should be and then recently so I got myself a very very big printer for plastics and um, I was trying to calibrate it and so I started making those shapes let me show you these kind of shapes um and the idea was just to calibrate the printer so that the shape is designed so that i know about the overhangs uh the sharp corners and i was making different tryouts in speeds and layer heights and stuff like this and then i realized that i could um uh people people were interested in them so i thought to myself then if people are interested in them then i might i, I, I might as well just sell them and so initially they were vases but then i found that it, they would be probably better as lamps so i started stacking them and gluing them together and i made I'm making those lamps which range from 40 centimeter to sometimes four meter high so these ones are about 150 and yeah you can have some which are really much bigger and um, um, because I had such a hard time pricing myself I decided to instead of going to something 
like to the emotion and the sentiment, sentimental value I put in the project. I'm just pricing them by the hour. And it's for some people it's too expensive. For some people it's not expensive enough, but at least I stuck, I stick to a system. So, and the system justifies um, the price. So it's, I, I price them at 26 euro per hour. So they can get quite expensive because sometimes it's like 200 hours printing. And um, I think it's also quite easy um, because I'm in Paris and there's a big, big design scene and there's a lot of different fairs and there's a lot of potential buyers and galleries and stuff like this. So it's easy to, um, because when you're a designer uh, nowadays, it's not only about the product that you're making, but it's also a lot about the, the image of yourself, the, the designer is, the name of the designer is basically the brand and people often buy the brand rather than the object. That's what I've realized uh, when I started selling those. So um, now I'm quite comfortable with the price I'm selling them because people are interested and they're buying them. So it seems like it's justified, but uh, it's also probably because in this school I was in, a lot of uh, um, influential designers come out of that school. So you're basically bathing in this environment where everybody uh, prices their project very expensive. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the problem with undervaluing yourself is that then you, it's really hard to um, make a real living and also to have your products uh, raising in price and when you need to pay bills um, well it's obviously really important to know the value of your products and not undervalue them so for example uh, Daniel I know that he sells his uh, espresso cups uh, for quite cheap uh, in my opinion he could sell them for a bit more expensive um, and uh, it's all about like, you know, participating to as many fairs as you can, even if you're in South Africa and you can't do the, I don't know, New York design fair or London design fair. It's just a matter of sending your products over there um, and then getting a way to have a stand and then you get visibility and then recognition. And it, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, like a, a, a snowball, you know, when the snowball rolls, it it gathers up more snowflakes and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then with the inertia, um, uh, yeah, it becomes bigger and it is what it is. I don't know if the metaphor is correct, but um, yeah, the idea is that uh, it, for pricing your products, it's all about the, the most, the biggest problem people uh, encounter in design is when they start is how to price themselves and when once once they go past this it's just become way more logical and uh, intuitive and uh, sometimes I was working on projects um, like for six months uh, day and night and I would just set it for like uh, very cheap because for me it wasn't worth more um, and this was only six months ago now once you know, you know, uh, and it also comes, of course, with the buyers. You need to have some buyers for you to feel justified. Um, so maybe um, for these cappuccino cups or like tea mugs or stuff like this, um, start with the price that you feel comfortable with, that you don't feel like you're ripping people off um, and just see how they react. Like, for example, if you, how much would you sell a mug? or a, a cappuccino cup? Um, so we also, like, because we've been thinking about this for a long time, and the reason that we set up this meeting is like, maybe I am not gonna be the designer, you know, maybe I'm gonna be um, the producer for designers so that we can collaborate with designers who already have a brand and then they can um, create the value in terms of the design execution and we can just operate the machine and produce the items. And that way we understand that business because that's what we do for us in other parts of our business. Like we, we sell machine time, you know, same as what you were saying about your printer time. Um, 
but I think there's more to it than just the print of time because you've got a certain aesthetics that you've created and you've created this um, this object that has beauty and has now some credibility and, and all of those things. Now, if I take your file and I print it and I charge per hour, it shouldn't be the same. You know, it shouldn't just be about the, the, the hours. So there can be an hour component, but then there should be like a premium based on the fact that you've done it and you've got um, the design credibility you're talking about. Um, so like, it's like you buy one and it's got like no label. It's, it's still, you still have to pay for it, but it's not as expensive as one that has a label that comes from some space. And I think that's where we would like to be the one that's not, not labeled and you put your label on it. You know, you, you've got, you're responsible for a lot of what goes in, but not, not the actual production. Um, and that's like why we thought this would be a good place to start and have a conversation around collaboration with designers because that, that's your expertise as designers, you know, to like, to conceptualize something and to, to find value in something, an object. And we look at an object, we, and I say we, I'm, I'm sort of talking on behalf of engineers. They are like Hunt, Hunt and myself. Hunt, you can relate, right? Um, although I do, I do have a little bit more like design um, sensitivity than the average engineer. You know, art was my preferred subject, but I went into engineering by default. But the fact is, um, it's not my day-to-day -day job. I don't design for a living every day. And so I'm not in touch with what creates value in the design world. And um, so I might design an object, which I think is beautiful, but for whatever reason, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't have the credibility and all that. And so it will never be valued at the same price. Um, so I think that's where we, we're exploring. So what I think I'm saying is that we, the, as the printer, uh, I want to run that as a platform for any designer to use. And I myself personally, as Steve Gray might be one of the designers, may not be at the same level as everyone else. Um, so the objects we, we've figured out a per hour price based on the printing time, which um, actually I'm going to work it out, but it might be the exact same as you. Um, 400 divided by 17, it's 24 euros per hour. Mm. Um, yeah. But also it prints quickly because it's one millimeter um, and that includes the clay. So it's, it's probably cheap. Um, but if we did that, that would, that would keep our project going and it would allow us to like continue to evolve and develop. So we, it's enough, you know, um, we have other machines that we charge for 500 rand an hour to use. So that's why it didn't make sense when you make a whole new machine and run it and then charge less than that. Cause then might as well just buy a laser cut and just laser cut wood. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking is like the platform has a cost and then, and then the designer themselves can decide whatever they, they want to do. But there's also the value of a network. Like if we build a network, then you don't necessarily have to be known as an individual designer. Mm -hmm. You get the collective value of everyone who's participating. And then the other designers get the benefit of volume coming to that place, that one place. And they might see something that you've done and like it and it creates new people that want to buy from you, new, new, new customers. Um, so I see Martina's uh, joined us, Martina. Um, Wolfa, I don't know if I can say your name right, but uh, <laughs> oh, your your microphone is off. Okay. Ah, yeah. Hello, Martina. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, um, my name is Twelve. It means it's Twelve in German. My oh, okay, family cool. name is Twelve. No, Mrs. Twelve. No. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to Thank Durban. You. And, and France and Canada. <laughs> um, so we, um, you missed the sort of beginning part where I, I kind of showed some of the work that we're doing and I, I will quickly do a, another quick run, but hopefully you've seen the machine running. Um, Simba can just put that up again. Yeah. And, um, and Lucas joined us this week as well. And he's a designer, young designer, two years out of, out of college. Um, Starting to, I mean, he's done some beautiful labs that I came across um, 3D printing, and um, and then I thought, let me chat to him about collaborating. But I didn't realize you've done ceramic 3D printing, so it's quite yeah, it's quite good that I got hold of you. Um, and Martina, is, I think you can teach us all about design. That's that's your um, your legacy and what you've done for your career. Um, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. If you, I don't want to put you on the spot because I'm not yet to give okay. you work. But you're welcome to introduce yourself. 
Uh, just um, quickly, uh, I have started doing ceramics when I was 18 years old. I studied in Linz in, in Austria uh, at the university ceramic department. But then I also was uh, with scholarships in Amsterdam for one semester at Rietveld Academy and also in Kyoto for a year and a half no? in, in 1990. So I studied traditional Japanese techniques and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a really, I'm not a serious business person. I always did many different things. I jump around. I, I did all kinds of techniques and I try many things. And uh, uh, I went to fair also to exhibit for a couple of years in Frankfurt and also Maison Objet in, in Paris. Uh, so I had good, I mean, I still sold to very good institutions like Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco and in New York and to um, Paris, Paris, to Art Codif, to very good companies, but I was never good like it. I did everything on my own. Like uh, I was never good in administration and keeping contact and keeping my addresses together. And, you know, you have to do the regular mailings. I was always very bad at that. And the moment I had enough money, I go to travel or I, just spend it on experimenting. And uh, so I'm not good. Now I'm retired, but of course, I, I mean, the last three years I taught at the university in Vienna. I was uh, um, head of ceramic department at the, uh, in Vienna at the U University of Applied Art. Uh, and, but now I retire again. And um, I'm now, I mean, I have a very, I mean, a small retirement money, but it's enough to live on it. So I rather just want to experiment and do what I want. You know, I, I'm not really, uh, I don't really want on my own. I've worked a lot in my life. <laughs> I spent a couple of years in China, in, in America, on the California. So I did many things, but the, I remodeled many spaces. I had five different studios in five different spaces countries which always was a lot of work to set them up and uh, so you know I'm just <laughs> not into doing serious business now I do things if I like to do and if I'm interested but it's not that I really oh. want to be a well, business that's... person yeah, because yeah, I'm really good. bad at that <laughs> okay. it feels like we're all bad at that sometimes I think um... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry <laughs> but um i think when you just enjoy, to life, man. Just yeah money. when you enjoy your work and laugh more than money then you you're optimizing for other things not money all the time um yeah. and then every now and again you have to realize you need a bit more money so you can carry on and bring your life but then that's not it's the focus great to have more money to do project <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but um i'm excited to collaborate with you and and to explore especially your ceramic knowledge because we um i mean I'm talking about me now, but I don't have any formal ceramic or even informal knowledge. Like just the last two years we've been saying we've been printing with clay, but that's mm. not really, um, there's nothing traditional about it. Um, so some of the basic things that we probably are missing, you know, um, especially around glazing and opportunities to, to um, work with different types of materials and oxides. Um, so, and then I also think you, probably could leverage your your brand your personal brand so what lucas was saying about the designers having um, their own brand that that's what makes the object valuable is that made by a person who has the credibility um so if you if you worked with someone who did all the hard business stuff for you and just leveraged your 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 design ability and your 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 basically your credibility you could probably um, create some very good revenue for yourself. And I, I think it. so, but I never found someone to do this for yeah. me. Huh? Well, it could be that, because we're talking about a collaboration and that's, that's what I decided. I made this machine and I thought, well, how do I bring this machine into the world? You know, like, do I go and sell these machines? And like now try and go and market it. You should buy this printer, you should buy this printer. And I'm competing with people that are doing it. and. I don't like the idea that somebody phones me at 12 at night and says, my printer's not working. Why, why isn't it working? I want my money back. Uh, uh, for me, I like to help people. So I, I find it very hard to say no. So then I worked in manufacturing for six years and I, I know that lifestyle of having to 
make products that never break and, and people's expectation. And it's, it's not that fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hans, he's also here in from South Africa, but he's up um, 1,000 or oh, about 800 kilometers away from us. And okay. he's, he's built and sold many 3D printers. And he also said that the two ceramic printers that he built uh, and sold were a nightmare, like the support and the amount that he, pay, he charged for the printers didn't even cover his time to keep answering the phone and telling these people why it wasn't working. And they thought it was his fault, but meanwhile, they just didn't really know what they were doing. So I thought, I don't really want to do that. So, but I've now invested so much time to make this machine work. It's, I can't throw it away. So what can I do? And I thought, if we print it for people, then they can bring their ideas to life. You know, then they can make something new that they haven't made. There's a lot of novelty and there's a lot of room to explore because it's such an emerging um, like thing, you know? Um, and then I thought, let's see if we can just collaborate and see who's out there that's interested in. The nice thing is that it makes it's a reason for people like yourself and Lucas and James to, to get together and to, to talk and get to know each other. And then, so who knows what can happen next, but mm -hmm. I, I do like the idea that we could find a way to collaborate and ongoingly in a way that's fun and expresses like our, our objectives for what we want to create, but also has, has some value, like it has some commercial value to mm -hmm. us, you know, so it's not like something we have to pay for ourselves and we have to like find time. I just find that when you, when you want to do something, um, you know, to find the time to do it, if it doesn't pay for, for its time, it's difficult. Um, but if you know that, hey, this is something that's making me a bit of money, just at least it's covering a bit of my time, I'm getting to explore something. And instead of having to like pay for materials, the materials are paying for themselves, you know. Um, so hopefully we can kind of continue to collaborate in that way. Um, I would be delighted yeah. to uh, produce one kind of uh, model or or like a 3D model I could send you. And uh, so since now I have some experience with uh, the difference between uh, the kind of geometries you can create for plastic printing and ceramic printing, thanks to Daniel, um, I might have some ideas on how I could adapt these um, uh, models I've been working on uh, to make them also a little bit less personal so that they can be more into something that belongs to a community uh, so that it's not it could be like me making them but like um, it, with some space for the the whole makerspace uh, environment to you know uh, appropriate them uh, as well um, Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave the meeting now, but um, um, maybe I, I can join the next meeting and then talk uh, talk about, about that a little bit in more depth. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, yeah. I'll make a 3D model and we could see how printable this is and uh, things like this. If that's yeah, you guys. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's cool. Um, I also think it doesn't have to be, uh, we're not talking about collaboration. It doesn't have to be that um you giving up um anything you know it could be you literally print the thing you want to print i mean you send us the file that you want to print we print it for you and you promote it we send it over back to you fire it and send it to you um but the fact that we we kind of uh, communicate that that happened you know it's like look we've made this object at this place with yeah. this community so i yeah. think each of us we shouldn't necessarily compromise our own personal design but we should um, we should say, oh, here's a place we can we can all publicly do it. Like we can do it together and say, like, um, if you're interested in ceramic objects, if you're interested in um, that kind of design and platform, and then even like for example, the and I'm not saying we would do this, but like if you look at having an online shop, if every one of us has our own online shop, it's like we're doing that work ten times. But if we have one place where we can put people together and say that's where it happens um then just the fact that we've got different designers and different people from around the world makes for an interesting story um so it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be something that costs you anything like i'm not saying you have to give away your design um and then now we're just mm -hmm. going to print it and then we can sell it for whatever we want i think we could we could create a model where again we we charge for the printing cost and then you whatever else you could put a price point and charge whatever you want and we can sell them yeah and you can sell them wherever um but the same way we can also experiment with different objects and um, just see what happens. I think we all like kind of understand that it's a collaborative and, and exploratory process. So 
Um, let's see what it's happens. It's kind of a kind of a fab lab, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been great to to have you on the call, and um, look yeah. forward to to chatting more. Um, yeah, exactly. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Trev, you. Trev and the Nice joining us from his car. <laughs> hey guys, yo. So, um, when you guys were talking about this like uh, community collaboration, and we're like adding our own designs in, the first thing that popped up in my head was my cell phone. If I turn my cell phone, and it goes Samsung powered by Android. So it could be like that effect. If you can sort of understand that, so you're not giving your designs away but you are powering another kind of system. So you as a designer are influential in developing this community-based um, thing. And you do, uh, you do a lot, some of your design integrity into this community. So you power this community in some sort of way, you know, like you just utilize that and then just sort of modify it slightly. So like a fab lab in a way, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really cool thing. So all of this sort of ceramic stuff that you're doing, Steve, and like I've already drawn on from that, like using the ceramic printer. I want to print um, biological uh, mycelium. I want to print that into structures and forms. And then, and then like listening to all of these conversations of, you know, how to design and why to design, it, it helps me as an informed designer well, it helps me to be an informed designer when looking at, at the problems I'm going to face all along the way. You know, so it's really, uh, it, it, it's, it's something that's necessary. Um, and at this moment, it's like a seed idea, I think. So, so to, to have these collaborations really starts developing a network and an understanding between like amateur design and professional design and what are the bridges that need to be, uh, uh, so what are the gaps that need to be bridged up between everything? So yeah, it's like, I don't know, it, it, like a bridge really, you know? So we are, like, we've got reach. All of us have got reach in some way. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I've got my whole family. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just going to have to say bye. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, I can catch up uh, next time to what's been said when I'm gone. Cool, but, uh, Lucas. Thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you next time then. Cool, man. It's been great. We'll catch bye. up also on email with the, with the files and everything. Thanks. OK. Man. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. 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 Um, so, so maybe just quickly, um, I'm going to just for Martina's benefit quickly go back to the objects and just give you an update on show. Sorry, you guys have all seen this like 25 times. Um, but while I'm doing that, Hans, do you want to just talk about, I, I think you guys, do you guys want to talk about the printing of mycelium, Trevor and Hans, if you do, let me know. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, where I've got so far with the mycelium is I've, I bought a cake decorator and managed to get some mycelium paste uh, alongside with some liquid culture. And then I tuned the substrate a little bit so that I was getting, you can get sort of like very plasticky, flexible stuff as opposed to um, some rigid stuff, depends what you feed it. So uh, that worked really well. Um, the one big thing that I see with printing in mycelium is the lab-like conditions. So the, the ceramic printer for me offered, offered something that the other printers didn't, and that was the actual structure of it. It allows me to create a sort of micro lab while it's printing. So I can sanitize the thing and then enclose the space and print and allow the form to grow and bind and let the polymers do their job. And then eventually, obviously take it out and then let it um, bake it to make it inert. 
Um, but that, what that does as well is it kills my print time. So my print time on something like that would be, let's say 10 hours of print and then like, like nine to two, uh, nine days to 14 days of curing inside the printer and then removing it for the next print. So that's like an issue that I've got. So my print time is like really down all the time, if you want to look at it like that. Um, and then also the strains, the strains are very important. So I found that the most aggressive strain to print with, or the most, the most aggressive grower is just a generic oyster mushroom. They actually will eat anything and very quickly. So um, the end result of all of this stuff, when you bake it and it's inert, it's got some really amazing properties. It's not only like biologically, it looks, uh, and sometimes they look very gross. <laughs> sometimes it smells really gross as well, but um, it's something that's very organic. Like there might be some mold structure growing on it sometimes. And uh, it gives these beautiful brown and golden and green juice to it. And then, um, but the other sort of amazing properties that I've started finding with this that me. Um, the other amazing properties that I found with this is that the actual final product is super fire resistant. Um, it's also water resistant as well. And then um, it's super lightweight which makes for some really um, interesting printing parameters. So as a lightweight material paste structure to print with, I think we've lost uh... pretty Um, so I think you could start getting around some of the things. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm still testing strains. All right, I think I we, gonna... Okay, I think we, we're losing we're losing Trevor there as he's driving uh, through the tunnels. Um, yeah, um, Martina, have you got any um, questions about what you what you're seeing on um, my screen in terms of the yeah, I think it's great that you printed the, uh, the scutoid. No? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I, um, I saw you printed in a size that it's also like a cup. Yeah, like, yeah, it is. Yeah, because my the idea was maybe about the vase, but it also would work as a cup. Hmm? Also, good, I said good, yeah. I'm more a practical person. Eh? So for me, a cup should be easy to clean. So like yes. things, even if they are pretty, like um, maybe with all the corners inside, it's not so hygienic, I think. Yes. And especially yeah. also the texture of printing if there isn't the thick glaze covering it. So all the yes. ridges are like filled, then it's yes. really not hygienic huh, for yes. this yes. kind yes. of use. Huh? So I was, I was yes. rather thinking of it as a vase huh? or two yeah. vases, either two separate shapes also, the original scutoid only has one wall in common, you know, this one wall. Yeah? Uh, yeah. And um, also, I mean, I don't know what kind, what kind of your printer, what it is able to do, because our printer at the university, it could only print like in one way. All, you know, he could not stop and con continue elsewhere. No? And yeah. also not like move the arm or so, like, just in one direction. No? So I think maybe your printer is the same. No? You cannot make like the pieces like with one wall, a shared wall. Um, yeah, maybe we can. With two chambers. No? Yes. Yeah, we can. Um, but it doesn't look as clean because you get a seam line. But it's, um, I've got an object. We just printed like a regular print with infill and everything. It prints fine. Just you get that line that runs down the middle where it starts and stops. Um, but so we, we've, we've mainly just gone to the single perimeter printing where we're just doing one continuous um, motion because you get a cleaner, a cleaner outside. Mm -hmm. 
um, but we can experiment with that. Um, so do you think we should make this one joined object and make it a bit higher up? Like make it yeah, well, sort of uh -huh. elongate it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. I mean, did you read the story about this shape in the yes, New Yorker? Yes, very interesting. Yes, yeah, it was very it, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so I think if, my, if, if this was produced in series, it's always, I mean, first of all, it, the finish need to be good, no? But also yes. then, like sell it with the story also. Yes. yes. Yeah, so people know what this shape is about. And what I find personally interesting, but then it needed more experimenting, is if you combine the 3D printing like with either ancient type of glazes, or you do it like here, you see this is a glufi glaze. No? Yeah. <laughs> it's just a yeah. test. No? You know this kind of glazes now, they are very modern now. No? Okay. Yeah. I don't know them, no. We, like I said, we have no knowledge of ceramics. Uh, okay. This is our... We just got some glass from a beer bottle. Okay. And put that's... that in one of our cups and it went gloopy as well. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we, so, so that glaze is kind of, um, um, how do you apply it? Is it quite thick? Almost like clay? No, I mean, uh, that's just, uh, this was just an experiment. No? Uh, what's yeah. really interesting, this kind of glaze is, it's like a, a middle thing between clay and glaze. Yeah. And like okay. the, when I did this, it was, I just, on a plaster bed, I poured a circle of this glaze material, but uh, I made like a, like a coil, so to um, like make a frame, huh? and I pour the glaze material into the frame on top, like of a, on a, a tissue, huh? so it doesn't mm. stick, huh? so it gets loose, and, and let it dry, and it was like maybe a two centimeter or one and a half centimeter bed, like bed a circle, and I place it in the kiln with the circle on there. And yeah, on top of that circle, I print with, a, I made a screen print with the blue, yeah? Okay. <laughs> like, um, uh, just any screen. I found a screen in, at the school, no? I just used the screen to print this pattern on top. And then I place it, the, the circle in the kiln, and then it melt down. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is just a simple test, but then in the first test, you could work it out. No? I think it's yeah. very nice in combination with the printing. I mean, you can also- Yeah, because, of it's, other because it's kind of <laughs> organic and, and it's not um, like geometric, like some of these, it's sort of a contrast between the geometry. Okay. Just a moment, I get something. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to glaze those objects of James's um, using the inside transparent, outside we're going to leave, uh, we're going to do one with a clear and one we're going to leave um, just the clay as it is. And then we're going to do a little bit of oxide, either on the top or bottom. Oh, yes, I saw those. <laughs> I, I put these on Instagram. It's also the glue place. Huh? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's very cool. <laughs> nice. Good fun. <laughs> Just a <like> vomit. <laughs> yeah. Even has little, little red pieces in the vomit. <laughs> Different kind of melting ability. You know? The green yeah. is melting hard, the red spots were melting only a little bit. Anyway, cool. I mean, a broad field of experimenting possible. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. So I'm, I'm very keen. I'm going to try and do elongated scutoids. Um, I think this is not an actual scutoid because it's got like a curved side, which I think was... I don't know. Just the interpretation of the... The printing software of the object so we're gonna we're gonna try to do some longer ones and we'll do a pair as well i mean I with, like, maybe you can find it on the internet i mean this it, it, it file is, yeah. was made to me for me by a guy from the math geometry department from the university so yes. i didn't do this file yeah yeah the there's quite a few generators on the internet that allow you to make the shape 
um, uh-huh. and, and customize it. They're like somebody coded it, you know, they've built the algorithm and uh-huh. you can say what size you want and then it automatically makes the shape for you. Wait, just a moment, my dog. So the unfortunate thing is that every time we've done this on a Friday afternoon, yeah. it has collapsed at the end. Oi. And I'm feeling like worried, yeah, about this one because oh, okay. it's quite big now. I mean, when and we did this, we worked with some bl- hair blow dryer to dry yes, it. Yes, we got this fan, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you think it's going to last? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we did, yeah, we, we've done this object before. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see it's quite large and that's the same one we're printing there, but it's bigger there and it's got all that detail. Like some of these. Uh-huh. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 So yeah. hopefully that one, that one stands the test of time. But mm-hmm. as I said, we've had bad luck on Friday. So. Mm-hmm. Cool. I just want to see if um, Peter set up. Um, so, oh, sorry, Steve. How long has that uh, print been going for? Um, huh? uh, since we, well, uh, no, it wasn't since we started because we started a few times. It's probably been going for an hour. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going a bit slow because we we don't want it to to fail unnecessarily. Yep. But uh, how long has it been printing? Okay. No, I saw you restart it many times. Okay, maybe an hour and a half. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I need. We've gone slower because we we're having problems. So, and um, that's an hour and a half so far. I think the last one, the full one, was an hour and a half. Um, so that's okay. like one. Of, it's going to be one of the longest prints we've done. Um, have you got like uh, any warping issues, you know, like similarly to uh, PLA printing and what have you? Is there anything that happens like that with the clay? Yeah, just the weight of the clay, it can it can collapse and it can warp a little bit. Um, uh, there's an object, because of its geometry, it warped. Um, I'm just going to flip this around, yeah. So, How high is that now? How high? Um, approximately the height? It's designed for 300. It's probably about 150 now millimeters. So this one, you can see it collapsed down. If you can <laughs> kind of imagine that it could never have printed that inside part below the cool, outside right? part. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of folded in on itself. Um, I thought it was intent. <laughs> No, well, you, yeah, it's like this part was heavy and it, it just sunk down over, you know, as it was printing, but you didn't really notice it because because of, of the shape, but um, it's like squashed, you know. Cool. But um, for example, in ceramics, like often, like uh, when you fire high, the clay gets very soft, no, and it also like uh, it's it's uh, drops a bit, huh? So, like when you do ceramic design, often you design it, and it's easy, like uh, to do it on in a three D program to in, from the start to make it a bit higher, so it can collapse right to the point where you want it to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, exactly. So we obviously design in for the shrinkage because it shrinks by about fifteen percent mm-hmm. um, from the from the original printing size down with the moisture that comes out of the clay when it when it goes hard. And then when you fire it, there's a little bit more shrinkage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like you said, it, it can collapse when it's soft and it can collapse in the kiln. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So, Pete, we're ready to go here. Okay, have you got any questions? Um, just, I'm, I'm in awe of everything. So, <laughs> I just want to listen. It's amazing. <laughs> Just um, come on, bro. Add something to the convo. I specifically turned my camera off. <laughs> Got this feedback loop going on. Here. Yeah. I'm watching everything. Watching and enjoying. 
So Kev's, Kevin's been, um, he's a local artist and entrepreneur in the creative field. And we've been collaborating on this project for a few weeks. Um, so we did all the initial objects. Well, not all of them, but some of the initial objects together and played with some color. And we, we, we had this idea to start uh, an online shop um, for some of the objects that we're making. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let me just do a quick check. Um, so James, how's your time, James? Kev's here, James, Simba. Uh, um, Trevor, how's your time? Okay, and Hans? Yeah, I'm How's good. How's your time, I'm huh? Good. Yeah, okay, no, cool. I'm good. Okay, so I'm, I'm um, what? I'm in product okay. mode. <laughs> so what I was going to do, well, what I was hoping to do, which may fail, so just just be aware of that, is to set up an Instagram shop. Uh, we're all on Instagram. I mean, we've all like that's where I've found Martina and James and. Um, uh, yeah, like the guys that are all interested in collaborating. Um, and so I thought if we can see how to set up an Instagram shop, that could be the, the kind of final part of the process. So the process being we collaborate with designers, um, we, we print the objects, we glaze the objects, and then we sell the objects. Um, so I think we could still... Um, this has turned into like an ongoing thing. It was supposed to be like a four week thing and we like had a very firm plan, but we've kind of seen that um, it's been organic. So I would like to, to next week to carry on and um, see if Martina can give us some kind of input on glazing and like while we actually glaze and give some input like remote control um, us. <laughs> what kind um, of equipment do you have? Yeah, do you have a spray booth? No, no, we don't, but we could make one, I guess. We could get a low a low volume spraying spraying okay. thing and just put up some some paper. So spraying, that's one option. Like an airbrush or like a, like a big spray gun. You know, I I I like uh, 10 years ago I bought my dog. <laughs> I bought two for each. 400 euro spray guns no? and now I don't get replacement parts anymore and I was like in, on the, in Peru last year and I bought the 8 euro spray gun in Iquitos yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it works fine no? <laughs> yes but, yes uh, so I think we'll buy we'll buy an 8 euro spray spray thing and you can you can help yeah, us I just need to have the the, the spray the co container it has to be on top not on the bottom yes, yes. That, huh? um, and then you can help us just in terms of glaze mix and uh, some technical stuff I guess but and then also you see you always want someone to validate your choices like should we use red should we use blue but actually I don't know if that's important. It's more like a case of do what you feel, you know? Like there's no magic, but, but there is magic with oxides because obviously that doesn't always turn out the same. So have you had much experimenting with, with gas and low oxygen environments, oxides? Reduction. Are you talking I'm to asking me? You, yes, Martina. <laughs> Uh, yes, I did some reduction. I mean, in China and Japan. I also have a gas kiln here, but I have hardly used it because I'm not familiar with it yet. But, okay. Uh, yeah. I know Raku. Uh, yeah, I have done many things. <laughs> cool. Um, I need, okay, we're going to, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run us through that Instagram setup. Um, as I remember it, um, but it's not too important if it works or not works. Um, I think we, we've had like a great meeting, we've connected and um, 
I'm excited to continue to work with you guys and see where we can end this thing or see how far we can go with it. Um, but yeah, and even with this particular idea of commercializing, um, we might find that there are better ways to do it and there are other ways to do it, but this is one way. So it's something I thought I would do and I thought I might as well do it live so that we can uh, have it recorded and share the experience. Mm -hmm. So please do excuse me if it fails, but I like to try things, so I don't mind it's not working. Um, um, so let's try to share the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is, you recognize this work, yeah? This is Martina's work. Um, okay. So the idea of this is to build a online uh, store mm -hmm. and for it to work from Instagram. So now I need to see my screen. So you need to come right in tight, eh? Um, can you do, can I put a chair and then you get it so that it doesn't move? Can you can I put a chair and then you you you, you, you like you get in so that I don't have to move like it's just locked in. Um, okay. Um, Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Sia Bong is just going to give us a little intro before I get stuck in, in terms of um, digital marketing. So he's got a little presentation that he's put together, um, which hopefully is interesting and helps us think about the commercial side and how to build that. Um, and it won't be too long, so it won't feel too much like work, hopefully. <laughs> See, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Hello, my name is Sia, and I am going to show you some basics on how to get e-commerce ready. I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen at the moment. Sorry. Okay. All right, so this, is, this will be just a few basic pieces of information that are supposed to help you get e-commerce ready. Um, just a few talking points will be how to build a customer persona, what a customer persona or buyer persona is, some keyword research and competitor analysis, uh, product visuals, as well as product copy. So we have our customer persona here, who is Inga Dawn, an interior designer. So these, our customer persona will be based on the ideal customer that will be purchasing our uh, geometric ceramics. So Inga is an interior designer that is based in a local city in Durban. Uh, she has been in business for the past 12 years and has a side business of her own. Uh, she has an honors degree in architecture but also a diploma in, in interior design she works as an asset libra librarian where she sources materials for her in, interior design studio she's married has two children and is part of a local book club uh, Inga's professional goals would be to establish herself as a pioneer and a game changer in the field she has heard of the additive manufacturing but hasn't seen a practical application of the technology Although she's from a small, she has a small clientele, her clients do trust her with, um, her, they do trust her opinion and they are willing to listen and take and, and just trust whatever new material or new technology she has to expose them to. So this customer persona is going to help us when it comes to building our online shop, when we're marketing to people on Instagram or any other social media platform. So we'll just base our messaging and 
um, the context or the context of our messaging towards a person like Inga. So just so when it comes to competitive competitors analysis, as anybody in the industry would know, you will always have someone that is doing something similar or the same as what you're doing. So in this case, we found an online store that is selling uh, ceramic 3D prints. Now, some very important things that we could see on our pages will be um, a high resolution product image. Ideally, you will have a nice title for your product, the price of your product, and just the, the some product details, like what colors are the products available in maybe different sizes, um, et cetera. And then uh, put more information about the product is also quite helpful. Um, so here we know how much capacity this, these cups hold, what material they made from, and the colors that they are available in. So an, another piece of um, going on with competitive analysis, you'd like to understand your product's copy. So um, part of this program is, um, a part of this section involves a lot of keyword research. As if we read our product copy, we'll realize that um, there are a few things that the advertiser mentions a couple of times. So that should you be searching for something for this kind of product, you would find you would, the search engine optimization that is in the detail would help you find this page um, more, more quickly or with more ease. So we know that the keywords that they're looking for here, or they're using mostly here are 3D printed stoneware, digitally designed and glazed. So when you mix these three together, you know that you will get a 3D printed um, item that has been digitally designed and glazed. So you know that you're working with clay, et cetera. You could add more keywords um, to make your, your product more distinct or so that it matches anybody else's search intent. And then um, another very important thing to have when you're building an online store are a return policy and some sort of refund policy, as well as shipping details. So how what, what are the regulations when it comes to shipping? Would it get to me in X amount of days? Um, and then when it comes to the refund policy, what if I buy this item and I don't like it? Um, that means that I need to know what you guys would do to help me with that kind of problem. A very good tool that I use for competitive analysis and keyword research is Uber Suggest. As you can see on this page, we have inserted the competitor's um, URL or their website page, and we will be able to understand the keywords that they are ranking for. So when we speak of keywords, these are the words that you, or the words or phrases that you would type into Google or any search bar to find the relevant product or service. So now we find that in this instance, our competitor is not actually ranking for anything that is 3D related or additive technology or additive manufacturing related. They are instead rating for binary refinery or their, their studio information, basically. And then if we do some keyword research into using Ubersuggest again, if we do some keyword research into 3D printed ceramics, we'll get quite a bit of information, how much it would cost. So the, the firstly, the search volume, the search volume refers to how many times that particular phrase or keyword is searched in a month. Um, this SEO difficulty, if the closer to a hundred it is, um, if the closer to 100 that number is, the more difficult it is to rank for that word. So you'd have to do or create quite a bit of content either on your website or on social media to rank for that word. And your search engine optimization um, would have to be on par on your website as well. And the more, the more important um, term that I'm looking for here is the cost per click. How much would it actually cost you um, if someone was to, if you were to start doing adverts on social, I mean, on social media or on Google's platform. So you know that we'd be spending in South Africa, we'd be spending six rand 49 cents for every time someone uh, found an advert that has got to do with our 3D ceramic, either the services or the, or the products. 
And then on our keyword planner, this also gives us a bit more insights if you're doing your keyword research. Uh, keyword planner is a Google's, it was one of Google's free tools. Um, this is very good for when you have, when your product, when your product is ready, your store is ready, and you'd like to start advertising uh, your products or your services. So when you do a bit of keyword research on Keyword Planner, you will find that um, there are quite a few keywords that we could use to, the keywords we could use in either our product description or on our websites to get more people on, on those platforms. Um, the average monthly search for 3D printed ceramics is low at the moment, which makes, which is, which will lead to a low cost per click. But then that means that you'd have to work harder to, or when, and I say work harder, you'd have to create more content so that you can rank on social media, I mean, social media or on um, search engines uh, when people are searching for such items. So another platform that I use to do keyword research is Answer the Public. Answer the Public is a great platform for anyone that needs to um, to generate content or get content ideas for the services that they're providing. And one thing I can assure you is that you will, you will be able to use this to answer a lot of the questions that your competitors or your customers might be looking for. So the keywords that I looked for in this case were additive manufacturing and 3D ceramic printing. So when it comes to additive manufacturing, one of the key phrases that really stuck out for me is, is additive manufacturing 3D printing? So I'm assuming that this is a question that some people are asking out there, but they haven't found a way to link the two. These questions can help you answer content and promote your items at the same time. Um, so another keyword, uh, more keyword research when it's got to do with 3D ceramic printing. Stuff that stuck out for me is, what is 3D, or what's a ceramic 3D printing, as well as can you 3D print ceramics? Now that we've got all of those items, so our keyword research is ideally going to help us build content, uh, written content around those topics. Um, and now that we are gifted to have Peter around us, who's um, a very talented product photographer. So now we, we these are, have been developed in-house. Um, designed by Sam. These are three products. One is the Zamboni mug, the spiral step vase, as well as, um, sorry, this is supposed to be a twisted vase, sorry. So now that you have this idea, these are all pieces of information that can help you with um, building your store, whether it's just an online store or one of the Facebook or Instagram stores that we've been speaking about. And when it comes to your product copy, um, using the keyword research that you've generated is quite ideal to describe your elements because we already know that with the keyword research, these are the topics that people are searching for. So if somebody is already searching for phrases that we can answer with our products, we might as well add that to our product description so that the search engines can find our products and match it to the people that have a query about this, either the services or the products that we're making. All right. So when it comes to carrying on with your with building a store, that would be very awesome. I just want to share uh, a mock store that we have created. Sorry, just drawing here. Okay. So I don't know if you can still see this. Um. So here's a, a to just to take all the information that we have. Uh, gathered from all of that research. Here is a mock online store that I've created. So we just titled this Sophisticated Ceramics, our online store, bespoke homeware engineered with additive manufacturing. So when you're describing your store, ideally you would like to insert your keywords into the description of your store. So in this case, um, what is sophisticated, what are sophisticated ceramics? Welcome to the world of 3D printed ceramics. The use of additive layer manufacturing has made its way to your homes with our bespoke homeware items. Um, do you 
So then um, just to go on and use more keywords to answer more questions and make it more relevant to the buyer as well as the crawlers that would be searching for the content that is related to either 3D printing or additive manufacturing, which are the two keywords that or key phrases that we're really targeting. Um, as you can see, the things that are very important, we've tried to include in our shop. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna work. And just to show you a preview of an item that we've added. Why is this not working? Oh, quickly. Um, so then here is our Zimboni mug. We've got our price. Uh, you can add it to the cart. You could buy it now. Um, and then here is the more product details. So if someone is likely to be searched, the more traffic this page gets with more promotions that we'll be doing either with, uh, with the more advertising we'll be doing either on social media or with Google platforms. Um, should we, the, the more keywords we're, we'll be using in here, for example, the 3D printed ceramics, as well as additive manufacturing. Um, when someone is searching for those separately or individually, I mean, or, or together, we will ideally like our page to rank and someone will find this information and make a purchase from our website. The best part is you can start linking your products to your social media page. And I believe that is what Steve will be taking on I will we'll be demonstrating after this presentation. Yeah. Right, cool. so yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. For that. Awesome, Brew. Great job. Um, can I can I we just make it slightly interactive because I think you you covered a lot and it's it's pretty technical for people that aren't in which none of us are in on the online commerce or anything. Um, True. So could we just like workshop something quickly, um, just for like five minutes, just yeah. to show like because I think you covered some important things that almost like went over our heads or we went we went past it a bit quick so the key things was how did you do the keyword searching like how did you figure out so i like the way that you ended up using whatever you'd found as a description and then that like obviously is going to then rank on search so um can we workshop something i don't know like yeah um kevin, kevin um you got any ideas or trevor you want to do some mycelium search search thing or um like um how, like what's the website you go to to do that search like maybe you can just show us those okay. tools like how you log in and get those tools working for you fantastic so, so i'm so just going to share sure, so sure, do you, uh, do you uh, have any yeah 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 anything so you'd like uh, to sell like theoretically <laughs> yes do mycelium or mushroom grown lamps lampshades Mushroom growing you lamps. You can find something like that. Okay. Because I know they exist, but it's also like it'll be that thing that you'd have to develop the SQLs on that sort of thing. I'd like to just see where it's standing at the moment. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay, let, let's do this. Let me share my screen. What kind of mushrooms? <laughs> Magic mushroom. What kind? <laughs> All kinds. <laughs> Blue mini. Um, okay, so um, I think I got the screen controlled, yeah? Okay, so, 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 so where do I go? I just search for um, mushroom lampshade. I'm going to get, it's going to be just the mushroom shape for sure. Yeah, mushroom lampshades. Try that. Or mushroom bases, mushroom chairs. Yeah, it'll be a keyword search, I think. What is a mushroom lamp? Sustainable lampshade. See what. I think this is the mushroom thing. Let me just grow in here. Mushrooms are the new plastics. Yes. Okay, grow it yourself, kit. Star new styrofoams, new plastics. Yeah. Um mycelium, mycelium lampshade. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. So now, um, Pia, what did I do to go and search this this thing? Okay, so I am on Uber Suggest. That is a a tool that I use to find keywords. Uber in... Suggest. Yes, I'm. I'm. Can you see my screen? No, yeah, no. I'm think, trying to. Think I'm trying to. Screen. No, you see, this is my, my screen. I'm trying to do it for the, like, there was- I, I can see what. the Uber suggest screen. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. You are sharing your screen. Okay. So we know that with Uber suggest at the moment, we have 390 monthly searches. Um, it's not that difficult to rank for this word. And we will be paying 45 US dollars or US, 45 US cents um, for, for an ad. Um, some related keyword ideas would be mushroom lampshades, mushroom pleated lampshade, laurel, is that laurel, lamp, mushroom lampshade, mushroom lampshade glass, vintage mushroom lampshade. No, those ones aren't, they aren't ranking that. So the SEO. That is. So, so the volume zero, right? It's not worth using those. So I'm going to see what answer the public is going to say about a mushroom lamp shade. Another very efficient way to get ideas for keywords is just a normal Google search. So um, there are normally suggestions that you'd get from Google when you do a search. So like I'm going to do mushroom lamp shade. And the, um, so these would be shopping, shopping ads sure. that I was referring to earlier. And then what people also ask uh, for, uh, that's another way to see what people are also searching for in terms of a mushroom lamp shades. Uh, okay, I have this great. So I can see already from the, the general sort of SQLs on this that the mushroom lamp shade is not what I'm talking about. It's okay. like a <laughs> it's like a plastic fabricated thing. Um, so so I don't know, maybe try mycelium lampshade. Please be kind enough to help me spell mycelium. M Y C. Oh, there it is. That's it. Yes. There it is. Yeah. So my CD. What are the search volumes on that? Um, so about. On that? Let me just check on Uber Suggest. Copy, and then Uber Suggest this one. Okay. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she wants. <laughs> no, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good that means no one's searching for it search no no one's searching for it well let's see if if we can find anything on google trends um google trends is also a very efficient way of finding out what people are like the what people are searching on on the web I suppose so uh, my search will be restricted to south africa but i can always change that Okay, this doesn't have any data in South Africa. I will see if I can go <laughs> worldwide, how, how that helps. You know, so, I have search um, mycelium experiments. Oh, nice. That gave some results. Thanks. Still, let's see what we get on Uber suggests. Experience. Wrong. Oops. Wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Still. Oh, right, that's only South Africa because I got some interesting results. Oh, really? Would you, may you please share those with us? Like um, mushroom mycelium experiments with submerged culture 
or the mycelium growth experiment update woodfordia.org. Um, I know there are people experimenting with mycelium substrate as a design material. Yeah. So, so just like, like a quick question. So there's no, nothing gets pulled up. What would the approach be then now if I wanted to pursue this? Like, you know, I want to like make mycelium lampshades, but in South Africa, there's nothing. So what would the like suggested approach be to start tackling this? You know, I don't know. That's quite a good question. Um, in my opinion, I would use more I would create content around it. Um, the more content I create around it, hopefully, um, so you just build a funnel, a normal marketing funnel, um, ADA model, attention, interest, desire, and then action. So you create attention, sure. I mean, awareness around the whole movement. So creating awareness around mycelium. So you create content, uh, make sure that it's relevant content so that people start sharing it around the right platforms. Um, if you're looking for something like mycelium, um, you associate it with other movements that are already started, have started and sure. been established. Once you connect yourself to that audience and you bring them, you bring their attention to what you're doing um, and they find interest, you can start creating a desire for them to um, test out the products or make use of the products, um, showing them how sure. uh, the application of the, pro um, the technology or the products in the real world scenario. And then that should ideally convince them to take action and purchase whatever it is that you are working on. Well, that's super interesting. Eh? So you have to become like an author. You have to create a narrative and a story yep. around the idea or around your product, but you're yes. like feeding people. You're not feeding the product directly to them. First, you have to create the acolytes and then you can feed the product, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's pretty it's cool, kind of, actually. It's kind of like how I didn't know that there was something called additive manufacturing or 3D printing until I was exposed to something like this. But now that I am, I'm trying to figure out how do you expose more people to it? You know, How do you create that awareness and attention to the fact that, well, you do have normal ceramic, well, traditional ceramic uh, manufacturing, or you could start using additive manu additive layer manufacturing, um, which is new age and the future because um, it's different. I found a, a ceramist in Durban. I went to school with her and I expo uh, she didn't know about um, what we're doing here. So I sent her a link to a video that we've just been doing and it changed her perspective about her trajectory on her career. So I think the, the awareness part is, is where we need to create more of a, a stronghold, I suppose, because um, I don't think there's much exposure to the kind of technology that people are doing right now. Um, I mean, if you're getting low search volumes for something that's um, this cutting edge, um, it means that I don't, I don't think that there's that many people that know about it. You know, like, uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah, I think that's the thing with uh, fighting for attention. You know, we all there's so much con con there's so much content out there, and there's so many we're on our devices all the time, and everyone's you know it's become like a they're gaming the system. You know, to try and get you your attention for longer. Um, so these yeah. obscure things that are actually more interesting don't don't get propagated to the top. Um, so something like what? mycelium manufacturing as a as, you know alternative to plastic is very interesting but we don't hear about it because we're watching you know videos about dances or something um some so that, that's why I like like these kind of sessions they, they're actually really good because in the current sort of market if you're creating product or something like that you have to be super agile in a lot of ways so knowing about how to approach um your clientele uh, meaningfully but with the correct kind of knowledge as well um it obviously assists you and then you, you you start gaining an advantage in a way because you have quite a good 
toolbox of uh, information to work with. You know, so like even in my head, it's it seems like oh, it's the next best thing. Why doesn't everybody have mycelium lampshades? <laughs> it's like, well, it's because nobody knows about them. That's why. And that that already is like, oh, okay, okay. So point one, we need to figure out how to uh, garner the audience, create the acolytes. And actually what you want is that you want those acolytes to then obviously sell your product because then your, your SQLs start changing again as well, you know? So you're like, you're the, you're, you're like a real designer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think like one right of the things the top, with, almost. yeah, one of the, one of the advantages, you know, modern advantages of, in terms of marketing and, and getting your product out there is to build an audience. So if you, if you look at the story of like mycelium and you kind of trying to create these products, but you, you haven't got them yet, so you can't sell them yet, but include the audience in the journey so by the time you're ready to sell them you you've got an audience of yeah. people that are really bought into this thing because they've been like like say you do a live stream you know like we do this we we're doing this on fridays we we've done a few live streams as well and we started to get this like little bit of momentum um but i'm imagining it's something you could you like build in public you know like share the steps but do it in a way that people can consume so like what's hard is the discipline of like updating people regularly because i found like when I, when my hands are dirty, I'm busy. I'm like stuck into this thing. I don't want to stop and take my video camera out and slow down. I just want to do it. But then at the end of the month, now I've got yeah. like videos and stuff, but it's too much and I don't want to edit it. So then you end up, you know, just skipping ahead right to the end. You show the photo of the final product. No one's seen that process. So they're not really bought into it. They're just like, oh, yeah, cool. But if they yeah. were part of that journey, they would have been like, wow, you, you got there, you know, or you didn't get there or like it's totally different to what you started with. And that's that interest is what you know you need um but yeah i think this is part of definitely the last step of this event was to think about it as like how do we take things to market because if we if we make these items and they just sit on our shelf like well that's already what we're doing so we want to take it one step further um and so i think we can learn that together and like you know hopefully that helps all of us because that'll be amazing i mean imagine if we can all figure this out and and have what we're doing and what we're interested in and pay us so that we can carry on doing it and pay our bills. Um, instead of like Martina says, having to fund our passion um, with the money we make for our day job. I mean, imagine if the money you're making from mycelium is funding your lifestyle and your mycelium experiment. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. But that's, yeah, that's kind of the end game. So yeah. I think, um, okay, yeah, I think it's been a good session and I think we should wrap it up. Um, we um i think i'm going to just invite you guys next week and and we we can carry on exploring the ceramic stuff and then at some point you know we can we can start testing some mycelium printing like you know let's let's if you want to roll that in obviously if you look at the interest levels like no one's knowing about mycelium so this could be one way of of bringing it to the to the fore you know like starting with the public kind of yeah. development and you had your hand up? Yes. Um, I just want to add here, um, I've had very much the same type of situation um, a while ago, and it was with my ceramic evaporative wine coolers. Now, that's a thing also, it's exactly like your mycelium mushroom thing. People don't go and search for mycelium lampshades. They don't know about it exactly like they don't go and search for ceramic evaporative wine coolers. So they go only and search for wine coolers. Then they get all the plastic ones and the stainless steel ones with ice. And they don't get to the, so the evaporative wine coolers. So, um, Sia Bonga. Um, how do you, it's exactly what I've watched your story here with the search words and so, and I would really have loved if I have known you before, because I went, I, I was working with a South African agents to, um, um, on, on Amazon and we, and we didn't have the right uh, search words. 
um, ceramic evaporator, wine cooler, uh, people didn't get to the uniqueness of this evaporative wine cooler. And so the whole the whole story went, 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 went really up um, eventually. So I absolutely agree with what you're talking here. It's super, super important to get that right, especially with a, with a product like a mycelium lampshade. Hmm. I mean, that's right. It's actually really important that, eh? So you, you think, <laughs> yeah. I think as makers, you also like, you, you're, you're so far down the pipeline as well with your ideas. <laughs> yes, so, yes, yes. You know, that so you, you just call it a, thing. yeah, and so you, you, you don't call it what other people would call it. Yes. So, yes. and then, and then you get stuck and you wonder why people aren't finding it. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's you know? why I really love, liked your presentation, Sir Bonga. It Thank was you very really, much, really good. Because it look, it's good. relevant. It is relevant. One thing that is, um, you could always do with your products is to find, um, this is an element and a segment called influencer marketing. It usually works very well. Um, you would find someone in the industry or that is closely related to your industry that would market your products for you on social media. Yeah. So someone that has a large following. You could pay them on very often if it's on Instagram, you could pay them, let's say, a thousand rand to just advertise your products and its details and a website per se. They would have that post up for about 20, 24 to 48 hours and their followers, who are ideally your ideal customers as well, would okay, then so, be okay, to like, that technology. Somebody, somebody like take a lot. Then they say, a ceramic, ceramic evaporator, wine cooler, what is that? No, no, we don't want that. Take a lot have said that about the product. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe this is a, do a quick workshop, like literally like, Two, three minutes on that particular search term and see what should the approach be or what are the alternative evaporative you, wine if you're yeah, having difficulty cool with finding your if we already not finding any search terms for your or just search history for the terms that you're looking for ideally yeah. is to create content that would be related to those terms prior to i mean trying to generate more more traffic so your your website if you have a website your facebook page as well as any mm. any form of communication that you have between yourself and your audience should have the right key terms for what it is that you would like to be associated with um, so for yeah. wine cooling apparatus you know that your target market are wine connoisseurs you know no no one that yeah. is like a, a 20 rand bottle of wine drinker will be in your like your target market so in that case yeah. it's either yeah. you would find uh an, a bottle a, a wine shop that is very niche that would be interested in working with your products has uh, a lot of traffic to their website um great social media following so i'm not looking for someone that <laughs> is um high up there alternatively you would find um a well-known wine person that is in like just yeah. someone in the wine community, have a conversation with them. You know, um, if your product is that great, send it to them and say, look, here's my product. Could you do a video on your social media with your team saying that? Well, I've done it you, wrong. I've done it wrong. So <laughs> these are just, um, the, these are cost effective ways of getting your product out there, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so you just give them the a sample product to say, hey, look, please, could you just share this with your audience? Use it. Mm. If you trust it, please share it with your audience. And that is yours to keep. I think mm. that is a great way to start. Um, that I'm will definitely you, get traffic to your website, get traffic to your social yeah. media. And then what the assets that you'd have on your website or on your social media mm. should convert to your customers thereafter. But then that's when you'd look into, I mean, the average website converts someone at like less than 1%. So if there's something called conversion rate optimization, that is something that you would have to look into thereafter. Once the right people have gotten access to your product 
and they've started driving traffic to whatever source there is for your wherever place you have your your products or where you're selling it so if it's social media they will be driving traffic to your social media people would learn about your products learn about your business and possibly find other products that they didn't even know that they needed because you offer one a great product that they found loved and now they've become one your customer and then once they start using more of the products, oh, yeah, yeah, you want yeah. people to be your advocates and to share yeah. with other people that they know that would be, that would find your products quite beneficial and useful. I don't know thank if that you. answers thank your, your yeah, question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a okay, so I think Thank you, thank you, Shimon. And that's what my name is. I think, ah, um... <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think that's um, maybe something we could work on as part of this collaboration, uh, Hans, if you want to, um, we could we could take the wine cooler. You've already got the the the, the files. We could. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you st you still got some some objects, or we could print them as well. Print your your one down here, and then we could um, we could see how we could wrap that into this collaboration. Huh? Um, and maybe just the buy-in of everyone that that's involved, you might get that little bit of escape velocity. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, but let's, and yeah, so, so maybe that's something you want to do. Wine bottle fits in there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so maybe we can, we can continue, like, possibly collaborating on that next week. And then... Um, yeah, yeah, open, open for discussion. Absolutely, Steve. Um, yes. Cool. And then um, I think we're going to continue next week, trying to see if we can get that Instagram shop working and if we can share that. And then... We definitely talked this week with some of the designers about looking at an international footprint, like that exactly. thing could have could have arms in different different countries and different mm. regions, um, which is is pretty exciting. Um, and then obviously there's there's also mycelium as a as a thing, that's a little bit of a side project. Yes, there, yes, I would like to hear. Uh, have you got some some photos or how does this stuff look? Tim? Uh, if you give me two seconds, I'll show you something really cool. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so this one, this one isn't printed, but it was the beginning sort of notion on can you create three-dimensional objects with the mycelium as the biopolymer? So I'm just going to show you that. That is a chair. <laughs> We grew yeah. the chair in nine days. Say again, you grew the chair? So yeah, in nine days. Oh, wow. So the, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, along that way, I found some very cool uh, stuff. So the mycelial sort of with the cake decorator, those are at work. Um, yeah. But, so I'm not there at the moment. But what I found along the way is that, um, you know, obviously with tinkering and testing, you serendipitously find out things. Um, PVC is a really good insulator to grow mycelium. So a lot of my 3D printer that's being built is PVC. Uh, PVC holds the heat. Um, it's also water resistant as okay. well. Yeah, it's like... Um, and then the next batch, antibacterial. Yeah, you know, the next batch that I'm gonna sort of uh, hand print out, I'm actually gonna do it with perlite. So perlite's got some really cool properties, mm. fire-resistant properties, and, and lightweight properties. And then the mycelium there is mm -hmm. just a polymer. It's just the glue. It's yeah. So I'm I'm interested to see if you could fire something like that because it is expanded volcanic rock. So it would take the heat really well. I'm uh, interested to see kind of what would happen inside a kiln. So basically, like, I'm just mm. replacing clay with mycelium, but following the same yeah, lines yeah. as what you guys are doing. Yeah. Because yeah, in my head, yeah, yeah. I see no difference between the paste structure. So I'm just looking at yes. it as a paste, which is, yeah. it's, it's proving fruitful <laughs> mm. in a way. Yeah. No, so, yeah, excellent, because I do like printing with lots of different materials. Last week, exactly last week, I was, uh, I was trying to help 
some people that vet with dual polymer um, that they want to replace cement with. Okay. And okay, that's interesting. The, it's uh, so it's all new things that yeah. Where is that going to lead us? If we can do yeah. that with three D printing, um, it's now almost a joke. My favorite material to three D print with is millipop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I can send you pictures and stuff. It's really. Um, and then always people ask you now, why do you want to print with millipop? The next, the next question, why not? You, uh, exactly. it's a beauty, it, it, um, but okay, that with a paste extruder. Um, yeah. so it's the big syringe. You just put your millipop in there and just think at, at your next dry place. You do 3D printed pop cups for the guys. It, um, yeah, it's just a conversation piece. It's a conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. piece. Or go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and they offer um, pop, but now offer them a 3D printed millipop um, bucky. Why not? It's it's just for the for the fun of it. It just shows oh, that um, you can use technology. Um, because I've I have um, three D printed chocolate for years, so yeah. chocolate uh, and do um, who was saying icing sugar as well. I've started with icing sugar, but I think that's where I got uh, pipe bursts and icing sugar go hand in hand. <laughs> it's so, but but yeah, you can do wonderful work with. Um, and but okay, something like smooth peanut butter that really works nice and yeah. custard and jam, those type of things. So mycelium, I would I would very much like to have a have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. There's quite a there's quite a few recipes. So my first recipe that I got was from a paper that I read uh, that came out of China, and they were trying to uh, see if they could print the mycelial um, paste, and it's like basic kitchen stuff. I mean, like if you if you really dig into mushrooms, what they're looking for is um, sugars and um, carbohydrates. And even fats, they pretty okay. much like us. They're just looking yeah. for energy, energy strikes, you know. Um, and so sugars are quick yeah. ones for them. Okay. Carbohydrates are just a little bit longer, and then fats are even better Ooh, because you get a weird something weird happens with fat. Um, but if you're looking, if you're looking to it, you're you're making like a bread dough, in a way, but with uh, cornstarch, and then just yeah, using liquid yeah. culture. Yeah, you just use the liquid yeah. culture. And then you just That's have to nice. figure out how to get your consistency right, you know. So yes, if you yes, if you yes. if you want to work with a consistency closer to peanut butter, then it's like adding a bit more fat into it, and mm. it's it just you, you're creating that sort of texture, you know. But the mycelium yeah, just yeah. needs food, man. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah okay. Yeah, okay, that's cool. interesting. Mm. And then if you start like really digging on the stuff, um really what you want to be doing, this is kind of where I'm sort of wanting to go, where you, what you give it is you can get an expected outcome. So what okay. I mean by that is if you feed it a low nutrition substrate or food, and that's more like um, brands and stuff like that, if you feed it that, it makes a really rigid structure. So it becomes... Mm -hmm. Um, like very crispy in a way but if you feed it like malt and sugars and honey and stuff like that it gets very flexible mm. it becomes um, almost okay. like, like leathery you know? so you can um, <laughs> yeah so I, I I did this course at MIT and they were talking specifically about this and it's quite interesting that you guys are tinkering with all this because the next phase here isn't our machines so like Steve like you're saying it's not to make the machines 
because you're going to compete with everybody. We've hit that plateau there in a way. It's about the materials that we're putting into the machines. The efficiency there is where the next sort of round of tech is going to come. And that's where everybody's sort of looking and focusing. So if you can tune, they call it um, tuning, molecular tuning. If you understand at molecular level what's kind of going on there, and you can put an input in to get a targeted output, you are building um, multi-scaled sort of materials. You, you're working from the microscopic scale all the way into that macroscopic scale like that. And that starts becoming very interesting. So you, you can start, like what you're 3D printing, you're building it from that molecular scale up like that. Even um, understanding yeah. play, like having the ceramicists as part of this group, Steve, is really important because those clay molecules are doing something very specific when you're binding them or even when you're printing them. And to understand yeah. that, then you can start manipulating that stuff to sort of get a particular output, you know? So it's like, yeah, yeah. It's, really, it's a really cool field to start tinkering. Generally, we look at like top down when we're fabricating or manufacturing. Oh, this is hard. Yes, I'm going to use it to make furniture, you know, but it's not, we don't ever, ever ask that question of why is it hard? Can we replicate it and can we change it so that it's even better, you know? And so by working with the 3D printer and the additive manufacturing and the clay and the ceramics and the mycelium yeah, yeah. and even the millipath, it's yeah. understanding at that molecular level what's happening so that we can mm. sort of go to the next phase. Mm. Mm. And mm. that next phase is, is critical, I think. So we're, mm. even like printing the Millipup, it's creating stepping stones. For what exactly. reason? We'll know when we get there. <laughs> and it's a yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a conversation piece. Yeah. Yeah, but if you fire that, you fire that, it can be more than a conversation piece because it's only yeah. one, it's only a few processes away from PLA, you know. It, oh, yes, yes, yes on, exactly. Yeah. So you've exactly. created a cornstarch, but yeah. you've now got moisture, which you need to take out, otherwise you're going to get yeah. bacterial growth, unless obviously you're trying to grow mm. mycelium. But if you put it in, an, in a kiln for a certain amount of time at like 150 degrees or something, or, or, or certain, maybe, you know, you, you extract all the moisture and you, you bind all those starches together at a certain temperature, mm. Um, you'll have some sort of plastic-like material. And it yeah, won't be yeah. in, invincible, but, and it will dissolve in water because you haven't fused it together. It doesn't polymerize. But, yeah. you know, as we're searching for alternative materials, it's definitely something that is an interesting experiment to have. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just wrap it up. Uh, it's been a okay. pretty good meeting. Um, Excellent, yeah. I think yes. I'm going to send you guys like a, just a summary mail on what we've covered and where we are in terms of the, just the, the collaboration. Um, and then I'm excited to continue with you guys and see um, you know, where, we can, where we can take this thing. Excellent. Sounds good. Cool. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. Awesome. Have a good evening. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, okay. cool. um, I'll sort of have a 40 minutes today. Thank you, Charles. Cheers, guys. Well.